Ja, till mig orsaka vi då har haft tekniska trubbelägar, men nu får vi det halta fram vid dagens texte och Åta Ström, a law student here, she'll be the moderator for the arrangement. Tack för det. Ja. <coughs> vi börjar först vi eh, Mikael Karlsson som är professor här, som ska lägga fram om right about what a reflection on sanctions and legal obligation. Yes, well. Does this now work or? Yeah. You can hear me. Okay, good. Uh, <coughs> my voice is a little weak and uh, so I'm glad to have a microphone. I don't know what's wrong with it. Um, but anyway, uh, <coughs> this, uh, I have a I have a text. Uh, it's probably too long as it is, and it's incomplete. So I'll go as far as I could with uh, can with the uh, uh, announced title. Um, write about what a reflection on sanctions and legal obligation. <clears throat> so it's a pleasure to be able to interact with the leading legal scholar and of the caliber of Frederick Schauer. This symposium gives us the opportunity to prevent, present Professor Schauer with some of our reactions to his work, wherein he has often taken challenging and controversial positions on various subjects, and while that's, which while stimulating and provocative are often puzzling to one who encounters them only in print. So today we can query the oracle himself and hopefully receive some guidance for the perplexed. In an article published in 2010, <coughs> Professor Schauer asks, was Austin right after all on the role of sanctions in a theory of law? He says that in modern jurisprudence, it's taken as axiomatic that John Austin's sanction-based account of law and legal obligation was demolished in H.L.A. Hart's book, The Concept of Law. And he goes on to suggest that despite its nearly universal acceptance, Hart's critique of Austin's account is seriously deficient and that Austin may have been right after all, at least about some things doesn't deny that uh, many of Hart's criticisms are good. But right about what? I don't find it easy to discern just what Professor Schauer thinks that Austin was right about and Hart wrong. Uh, but before going further in an attempt to get clear about what Professor Schauer sees as the divisive issues, it's important not to leave today's audience behind. Uh, our students here are familiar with Hart's concept of law and have read about Austin. They've also read a number of Professor Schauer's articles and may even have read the article that I hope to talk about here today and clarify with Professor Schauer's help. And others here present may be very well versed in the relevant text and issues, but still others may need to be put into the picture so that this talk will have something to say to them. Uh, since both Hart and Professor Schauer begin by talking about what Schauer calls John Austin's sanction-based account of law and legal obligation, it would be appropriate to review briefly what that is and also what Hart and Schauer suppose it to be. This review can't be very complete. Um, but it's still, I fear, uh, rather too long and detailed, but uh, I couldn't uh, manage better than I've done so far. So to look at what it is, what uh, Austin's account of law and legal obligation is, we should turn to Austin himself. Necessarily, our visit must be brief, but I will, for the most part, quote Austin and let him speak for himself, because Austin has often been misunderstood through failure to pay close attention to his words. 
Austin goes to great pains to explain, one, what he means by law, literally or properly so-called, as he puts it, in its most general sense, along with, two, what he recognizes as the several distinct types of law, properly so-called, distinguishing one from another and focusing especially upon what he calls positive law, that is, law simply and strictly so-called, and finally, three, what may be called law improperly, that is, in an extended sense, either by close or by slender analogy to law in its strict or proper sense. So first, he says, a law in its most general and comprehensive acceptation in which the term, in its literal meaning, is employed, may be said to be a rule laid down for the guidance of an intelligent being by an intelligent being having power over him. This is all in the masculine because nobody has power over women as far as I can make out. <laughs> Next, Austin specifies that, quote, every law or rule taken with the largest signification which can be given to the term properly, or which can be properly given to the term, is a command, or rather, laws or rules properly so-called are a species of commands. This is known as Austin's command theory of law. <clears throat> Since the term command, Austin says, is the key to the sciences of jurisprudence and morals, its meaning should be analyzed with precision. Accordingly, he says, I shall endeavor in the first instance to analyze the meaning of command. His analysis is more or less fully covered in the following passages. So first he says, it's a long quotation, if you express or intimate a wish that I shall do or forbear from some act, and if you will visit me with an evil, that just means something bad, because as far as I can make out, you can talk about goods, but you can't talk about bads. So you can talk about evils, which is why this term has persisted in uh, this sort of language. If you express or intimate a wish that I shall do or forbear from some act, and if you will visit me with an evil, in case I comply not with your wish, the expression or intimation of your wish is a command. Wish, no, oh, a command is distinguished from other significations of desire, not by the style in which the desire is signified. For example, if it's uh, signified in the imperative mode or something at some other way, but by the power and the purpose of the party commanding to inflict an evil or pain in case the desire be disregarded. That's what a command is. <coughs> uh, I'm sorry to say Austin never uses three words where 25 will suffice. <laughs> but he's trying to be exceptionally careful in his formulation. He's trying to be exceptionally clear. Then he says, being liable to evil from you if I comply not, if I don't comply, with a wish which you signify. I am bound or obliged by your command. Those are the terms he bound or obliged. Or I lie under a duty to obey it. If in spite of that evil in prospect, I comply not with the wish you signify, I am said to disobey your command or to violate the duty which it imposes. Command and duty are therefore correlative terms, concisely expressed. The meaning of the correlative expressions is this. He who will inflict an, inflict an evil in case his desire be disregarded utters a command by expressing or intimating his desire. He who is liable to the evil in case he disregard the desire is bound or obliged by the command. 
The evil which will probably be incurred in case a command is disobeyed, or to use an equivalent expression, in case a duty be broken, is frequently called a sanction or an enf enforcement of obedience. Or, varying the phrase, the command or the duty is said to be sanctioned or enforced by the chance of incurring the evil. Thus, the three terms, command, duty, and sanction, are inseparably connected. That is, they're interdefinable. This, then, is Austin's account of law properly or strictly so-called. So you can talk about things that are law, but not, may be called law, but are not law strictly so-called. And you may talk about things that are law <coughs> uh, that may not be properly so-called, but may still be called law improperly in various senses. In other words, <coughs> The term law does not just signify one kind of thing, although it comes under a general description. So first there are the laws or rules set by God to men, which, Austin says, are frequently called laws of nature, this category being in truth the only law of which it's possible to speak without a metaphor. But, he says, rejecting the appellation law of nature as ambiguous or misleading, I name those laws or rules as considered collectively in a, or in a mass the divine law or the law of God. And this is law strictly, but not simply so-called. Because it's called the law of God or the law of nature or the law of something else, not just called law, simply. But strictly speaking, it's law because it's a command. So God commands us in Austin's sense of command and has the power and purpose to inflict us with evils or pains, sanctions, if we disobey. And then there are the laws or rules set by men to men. But these are of two types, the laws set by political superiors to political inferiors, or as private persons in pursuance of legal rights. The last is a complication which I will henceforth ignore here. And this is positive law, he calls it, or law in the strict sense, called simply law. And finally, if you just talk about law, he thinks, you're talking about positive law. And finally, laws that comprise a part of what Austin calls positive morality, where by a rule of morality, he evidently means a rule for the direction of human conduct. The province of jurisprudence, that is, the law and the only law with which jurisprudence is properly concerned, is positive law, or law existing by position, law simply and strictly so-called. A political superior is political in the sense of being a government body or personage or sovereign entity, and superior in the sense of having power over the governed, the power to command by issuing rules that it can and aims to enforce, if necessary, through sanctions. A political inferior is inferior only in the sense of being subject to the power of the sovereign. Might be much better looking, for example. Uh, the part of positive morality that is properly or strictly so-called is comprised of positive rules set by A, men living in a state of nature, B, by sovereigns but not as political superiors, C, by private persons not in the pursuance of legal rights. And such rules can all be called commands in Austin's strict sense. And those who set them can have the power and purpose to impose the sanctions upon others for failure to comply. And this makes them laws in the strict sense on Austin's account. But they do not derive from a sovereign and are not laws of a polity. 
like positive law. Now, let's review Austin's account with some of HLA Hart's criticisms in mind. What does Hart think that Austin is wrong about? And why does Professor Schauer think that Austin might have been ri right about them after all, or some of them? According to Hart, the rules that Austin considers to be strictly so-called, including but not restricted to positive laws, there are these three kinds of positive laws, uh, three kinds of laws strictly so-called, <coughs> are explained by Austin as orders backed by threats. He also calls Austin's account the theory of law as coercive orders, understood in a certain sense. Austin Hart says, claims, that the key to the understanding of law is to be found in the simple notion of an order backed by threats, which Austin himself termed a command. That's a quote from Hart. Although Hart does not agree with Austin that representing laws as threats, as orders backed by threats, is the key to understanding them, he does agree, as do many, and perhaps most legal theorists, that the most prominent general feature of law at all times and places is that its existence means that a certain kind of human conduct are no longer optional but obligatory. He understands Austin's theory of law as coercive orders <coughs> to be aimed at accounting for the obligatory or binding normative character of law. After all, according to Hart himself, quote, long quotation, the first simplest sense in which conduct is no longer optional is when one man is forced to do what another tells him, not because he's physically compelled in the sense that his body is pushed or pulled about, but because the other threatens him with unpleasant consequences if he refuses. The gunman orders his victim to hand over his purse and threatens to shoot if he refuses. If the victim complies, we refer to the way in which he was forced to do so by saying that he was obliged to do so. To some, it has seemed clear that in this situation, where one person gives an order to another, gives another an order backed by threats, um, and in this sense of oblige, obliges him to comply, we have the essence of law. Sorry, I mangled that last sentence. <clears throat> I'll repeat it. To some, it has seemed clear that in this situation where one gives another an order backed by threats, and in this sense of oblige, obliges him to comply, we have the essence of law. But Hart goes on to argue that to view laws as cover coercive orders or orders backed by threats is a deficient way of trying to explain how law can make certain human conduct obligatory. Austin, Hart maintains, gets it wrong. But if I read him correctly, Professor Schauer thinks that this is one of the things that Austin gets right in its basics, if not in all details. <coughs> However, he seems to share with Hart the idea that Austin's account of laws, strictly so-called, can be described as considering laws to be coercive orders or orders backed by threats. Evidently accepting this language somewhat uncritically from Hart. A quote from Professor Schauer's article. He says, explaining the Austinian picture necessitates beginning with the question of legal obligation. In seeking to explain legal obligations and thus to explain how law can be binding, Austin, in the province of jurisprudence determined, and then in the lectures on jurisprudence, <coughs> insisted that they arise because the law threatens its subjects with sanctions should they not comply with law's directives. It's precisely the threat of sanction, therefore, 
which to Austin gives the law its normative force, which provides the law with its authority, and which consequently creates the very idea of legal obligation. Thus, Austin following Jeremy Bentham in stressing the coercive dimensions of law, held law to be binding precisely because of, abil of its ability to publish those who disobeyed its mandates. These sanctions, or at least the threat of them, were central to Austin's account of law. And Schauer opines that to Austin, the idea of a legal obligation became substantially less mysterious once we understood that legal subjects had, the, had an obligation to follow the law solely because the law threatened them with sanctions if they did not. Many other writers, whatever they thought of Austin and his command theory of law, have written in the same vein, perhaps understandably. For, as we saw earlier, Austin tells, uh, tells us that, quote, this is just a repeat, being liable to evil, evil from you if I comply, comply not with a wish <coughs> which you signify, I am bound or obliged by your command, or I lie under a duty to obey it. Command and duty are therefore correlative terms. Concisely expressed, their meaning is this. He who will inflict an evil in case his desire be regarded, disregarded utters a command by expressing or intimating his desire. He who is liable to evil in case he disregard the desire is bound or obliged by the command. But we must read Austin carefully and must pay attention to his methodology in those lectures where he's laying out his command theory. Little attention <coughs> has evidently, or insufficient attention, has evidently been paid to the fact that there's not a single occurrence of the word threat in the whole of the province of jurisprudence determined, or that there are likewise no occurrences of coercion or coercive, and but one each of coerce and coercing, neither one in connection with any attempt on Austin's part to explain the binding force of law or the basis of legal obligation. Uh, this, of course, doesn't prove anything, but it should give people pause if they want to redescribe Austin's account of law as an account of orders backed by threats or <coughs> uh, <coughs> uh, based on coercive orders, un this understood in a certain way. One of Hart's best known criticisms of Austin's account, as Hart reads it, is that in saying that in a situation where B is liable to evil from A, if B fails to comply with A's expressed wish that B act or refrain from acting in a particular manner, that B is bound or obliged by A's command or lies under a duty to obey it, Austin is failing to notice the distinction between being obliged, B's being obliged, and B's having an obligation to act as A commands. Quote from Hart. Let us recall the gunman situation. A orders B to hand over his money and threatens to shoot him if he does not comply. According to the theory of coercive orders, this situation illustrates the notion of obligation or duty in general. Legal obligation is to be found in this situation writ large, the gunman situation writ large. The plausibility of the, complaint, of the claim that the gunman situation displays the meaning of obligation, Hart says, lies in the fact that it is certainly one in which we would say that B, if he obeyed, was obliged to hand over his money. It is, however, equally certain that we should misdescribe the situation if we said on these facts that B had an obligation or a duty to hand over the money. So from the start, it's clear that we need something else for an understanding of the idea of obligation. I have to keep this in mind because it comes up later, and Professor Schauer has uh, 
have something important to say about it. There's a difference, Hart says, yet to be explained, between the assertion that someone was obliged to do something and the assertion that he had an obligation to do it. The first is often a statement about the beliefs and motives with which an action is done. Uh, B was obliged to hand over his money may simply mean, as it does in the gunman case, that he believed that some harm or other unpleasant consequences would befall him if he did not hand it over, and he handed it over to avoid those consequences. In such cases, the prospect of what would happen to the agent if he disobeyed has rendered something he would otherwise have preferred to have done, namely keeping the money, less eligible. <coughs> Now, whatever might have been the message, merits of Hart's message here, this is a message in which he is, uh, there's a, a focal criticism of Austin's theory of account, account of laws as orders backed by threats in this passage. There's more than one point of criticism. And we can perhaps review this in discussion. So whatever might have been the merits of Hart's message here, had it not been offered as an account of Austin's command theory of law, it exhibits a thorough misunderstanding of Austin's theory and of his project. Austin is endeavoring to found a new discipline, that of jurisprudence, and is following a well-known procedure to that end, which is one that's been followed from Aristotle to the present day and should therefore not be grossly misunderstood, even if some of Austin's language carries misleading suggestions. Sciences and disciplines in their early stages are largely concerned with determining and defining their subject matters. For this purpose, they define a set of basic terms. The definitions are stipulated, and the terms fitted together systematically. The hope is that the system thus formed will prove to be useful and illuminating in explaining some area of phenomena. The definitions mentioned <coughs> just above are working definitions. Appropriate criticism of such a nascent system would be to show that and why the chosen vocabulary and apparatus will not lead to the desired illumination. And if such a criticism is persuasive, then it's back to the drawing board. That's what I maintain that Austin is doing, which uh, Hart doesn't understand. Moreover, every such experiment is ordered to a certain explanatory or analytical purpose, even for what's nominally the same subject matter. So you could, for example, have different theories of law at this level different terminology, different set, set of basic terms, different definitions. Um, diff so even for what's normally the same subject matter, different systems with different vocabularies may be developed contemporaneously in order to reach different explanatory objectives. Now Austin announces his main objective early in his first lecture. Here's what he says. The principal purpose or scope of the six ensuing lectures, which are very long and wordy and complicated, is to distinguish positive laws, which are the appropriate matter of jurisprudence, from other objects with which they are connected by ties of resemblance and analogy and with which they are further connected by the common name of laws, and with which, therefore, they're often blended and confounded. So it's to isolate the province of jurisprudence. The title of the work is The Province of Jurisprudence Determined. That's what it's supposed to be about. And since such is the principal purpose of the six ensuing lectures, I style them considered as a whole the province of jurisprudence determined. And he then sketches out how he means to proceed. 
First, he says, I determine the essence or nature, which is common to all laws that are laws properly so called. In other words, I determine the essence or nature of a law imperative and proper. He's already explained this business about commands. And so, secondly, I determine the respective characters of the four several kinds into which laws may be aptly divided. Divine law, positive law, the po part of positive morality that is law properly so called, and the part of positive morality that is so called improperly but is closely analogous. Or, says Austin, changing the phrase, I determine the appropriate marks <clears throat> by which laws of each kind are distinguished from laws of the others. And by determining the essence or nature of a law imperative and proper, and by determining the respective characters of those four several kinds, I determine positively and negatively the appropriate matter of jurisprudence. Professor Schaller does not believe that law has any essence or nature, might object to the apparently essentialist direction that Austin takes here. But I think that that direction is only apparent. Uh, and I think it's also only apparent in other forms of so-called essentialism, M many of them. More to the point would be to consider what Austin means when he speaks of determining the essence or character of these various kinds of law, or for that matter, determining the province of jurisprudence. Or what he means a bit later when he speaks of analyzing certain basic terms, such as command, here are some of the things that Austin does not mean. He does not mean that he will examine the various things that are called law as they exist in the world in order to find out what each of them truly is, the essence or nature of each. Staring in, as uh, Woody Allen said, that he was uh, in his uh, metaphysics class uh, staring into the soul of the student who sat next to him. <laughs> In speaking of law, properly or improperly so called, he does not mean that he will examine what is said about law or about its characteristics, either in ordinary language or in the discourse of learned jurists, in order to find out what he calls the various kinds of law are uh, no, how what he calls the various kinds of law are or should be described or distinguished, or how their various characteristics are or should be described or understood against the standard of what we say, the standard of ordinary language. This is what Hart thinks he's doing, sometimes anyway. And he does not mean that he will analyze various concepts that appear in existing discourses, concepts such as command or obligation, in order to explain what is meant by them or how their semantic elements are related to one another in those discourses. So we have uh, an approach that's called uh, conceptual analysis, which seems to try to do that. Austin's not doing conceptual analysis in that sense. So rather we see Austin constructing a framework of various terms and categories whose meaning is given through definitions. <clears throat> definitions that stipulate what they are to mean in his account <laughs> rather than definitions that explicate their true meaning as might be misleadingly suggested by his talk of determining essences, or that explicate how they are normally understood in learned usage, as mistakenly suggested by his talk about what is properly or improperly so-called. We see him doing, in short, the same thing that Isaac Newton did in his mechanics when he proposed basic terms for it, such as force, mass, and acceleration and stipulated what they were to mean, defined their meaning in his mechanical theory. 
Newton's definitions were not offered as revelations of what terms such as force really meant, nor what they meant in ordinary language or in other learned discourses. Clearly what, if anything, the man on the Clapham omnibus meant by force, even the sort of force that might be applied in opening a door, was not <coughs> <coughs> was not that it is the mechanical product of mass and uh, the mathematical product of math and acceleration, mass and acceleration. These three terms being interdefinable in Newton's mechanical account, just as command, obligation, and sanctions are definitional co correlatives in uh, uh, Austin's account of law, strictly so called. Since, it is, as is plain from the passage quoted from Hart above, the one about uh, the gunman writ large, running out of time here, I gotta get, um, have to find a stopping point. Um, Hart grossly misunderstands Austin's project it's unsurprisingly, it's unsurprising that his critical points, points against Austin, the ones he mentions there, not many others, are almost all beside the point. It's, for example, irrelevant to the correctness or incorrectness of Austin's account of legal obligation that the envisioned gunman situation is one in which we would say that the gunman's victim, if he obeyed, was obliged to hand over the money or whether, quote, we should misdescribe the situation if we said on the, these facts that the victim had an obligation or duty to hand over to the money. For Austin's not playing to the standard of ordinary or even learned word, word usage, nor is it, as Hart maintains in that passage, clear from the consideration of the case of the gunmen with which Hart actually saddles Austin, this is not Austin's idea. Now we need something that goes beyond Austin's theory of coercive orders, as Hart calls it, to gain an understanding of the idea of obligation. <laughs> the idea of obligation. Hart famously argues that there's a linguistically indicated difference, at least in English, between being obliged and having an obligation that Austin overlooks or fails to account for. An order backed by a threat may oblige, but not obligate, its addressee to act in a certain way. This is the truth, we all say so, as the monkeys chanted to Mowgli in Kipling's tale. Yet Austin supposes that such an order binds or obliges its recipient and places him under a duty to obey him. Or so says Hart. Actually, Austin doesn't do that. Is this then something that Austin gets wrong, or one of the things that Shower thinks that Austin gets right, what was right about, after all? Well, there are a number of ways in which this critique of Austin's is, of Hart's is badly flawed. I'm going to finish this out and stop, because uh, I've more than used up my time, and we can pursue other things in one Professor Shower responds to this and, and we reply, but I'm going to finish this out. So um, there are a number of ways in which this critique of Hart, Hart's is badly flawed. Perhaps the most fundamental one, this is one that I have to bring in in order to continue the discussion with Professor Shower. Um, the most fundamental one is that Hart misunderstands and thus misinterprets Austin's command theory of law. And this is largely because, as previously maintained, Hart misunderstands Hart's project. Because Hart thinks that Austin is trying to give an account of law and legal obligation that accords with ordinary usage, what we say or don't say in everyday discourse, or is trying to analyze the concept of this or that as that concept presents itself in existing discourses, he fails really to pay attention to Austin's actual account. 
For example, Hart thinks that in speaking of commands, that Austin is speaking of orders backed by threats, as illustrated by the gunman example. But if we read Austin carefully, there is in fact no threat, explicit or Im implicit, that is an element of a command as defined by Austin. The communicative aspect of a command is the expression to its recipient of a wish that the recipient act or forbear from acting in a certain manner. What makes this expressed wish a command is that he who expresses the wish has the power and purpose of visiting the recipient of the expressed wish with sanctions, pains or evils of some kind, should the recipient not act in accordance with that wish. Austin thinks that there is a reason why a person should act in accordance with a command. The reason, not necessarily strong or conclusive, is that if he doesn't, he's likely to incur a sanction. This we may call an objective reason for compliance, but that person does not necessarily have a reason, his own subjective reason, for complying. For example, the recipient may not realize that the one who expresses the wish has the power and purpose of visiting him with sanctions should he fail to comply. Austin thinks of being bound or obliged as an objective situation. Hart thinks that being obliged is a subjective state. Uh, the statement that a person was obliged to obey someone, Hart says, is in the main a psychological one I don't know what in the main is meant to signify, uh, referring to the beliefs and motives with which an action was done. But motives may also be spoken of as objective. The difference can be illustrated through an anecdote about the famous bank robber, Willie Sutton. Asked why he robbed banks, Sutton was supposed to have replied, because that's where the money is. This is funny because the questioner was asking obviously about Sutton's subjective motive, whereas the reply was framed in terms of what we may call an objective motive. <coughs> Although the story was apparently made up by a newspaper reporter, the point is clear. The presence of money in banks may constitute a motive for robbing them, but it's not a psychological state. As to Sutton's motive in the subjective sense for robbing banks, he explained it himself in his book called Where the Money Was. Why do I rob banks? Because I enjoyed it. I loved it. I was more alive when I was inside a bank robbing it than at any other time in my life. I enjoyed everything about it so much that one or two weeks later I'd be out looking for the next job. But to me, the money was the chips, that's all. That's a subjective motive. <laughs> Since Hart thinks that to the man on the Clapham omnibus, a person's being obliged to someone's command, to obey someone's command would consist in his having a subjective motive to do so, he reads Austin as supposing that a command must be supposed to generate such a motive and must therefore bring the prospect of a sanction for non-compliance to the attention of the recipient of the command. So it must include a threat. Quote, A orders B to hand over his money and threatens to shoot him if he does not comply, as Hart puts it in the gunman case. Otherwise, it will produce no obligation. Austin might very well have supposed that in order for a command to affect someone's behavior, the prospect of a sanction must be brought to his attention. His subjective motive may be, as Austin occasionally says, fear of a sanction. However, Austin does not understand being obliged to do something as a subjective state. With respect to his account of law simply and strictly so-called, what he calls positive law, the presence of jurisprudence, we may artificially simplify his theory without distorting it over much by saying that laws in this category are just those expressed, those expressed rule-like wishes of the sovereign concerning our conduct that officials mean to enforce. 
These are the rules that we're obliged to obey. In this respect, Austin is a kind of realist, however we may want to describe him in other respects. Now, we as subjects may not know just what rules these are. We may, for example, be uncertain as to whether officials mean to enforce the rules of forbidding fraudulent banking practices. It's pretty uncertain. <laughs> if they are, in fact, then Austin maintains we are legally obliged to obey them. If they are not, we are not so obliged. This is the case whether or not we fear the prospect of a sanction for noncompliance. And even if officials explicitly, th explicitly threaten enforcement, we may be in uncertain as to whether the threats are idle. Officials may threaten sanctions for noncompliance with rules that they do not mean to enforce, or they may lead us to believe that they will not enforce rules that they do mean to enforce. For Austin, we are legally obliged to comply with rules that officials actually mean to enforce, whether or not we think or fear that they will. Professor Schauer may be legally obligated to pay his income taxes for a given year by April 15th of the following year, even if he doesn't know that he will be fined if he doesn't do so, and therefore, according to Hart, lacks a subjective motive or reason to do so. <laughs> um, last paragraph. There's more, unfortunately, but you'll be happy to know that I won't go into it yet. Now, whether Austin's account of being legally obligated is better or worse than Hart's, I will leave as an open question. My current opinion is that Austin's account is closer to being right, that is, illuminatingly explanatory, than Hart's, but that neither of them is really very good. However, this is not one of the things that Professor Schauer thinks may have been right about, uh, Austin may have been right about and Hart wrong, because Schauer misunderstands Austin's account in the same way as Hart. Understanding laws, or many of them, as species of orders backed by threats, being centrally interested in whether and how laws motivate us to steer our conduct in certain ways, and thus whether or not our subjective motivation springs primarily from the fear or at least the desire to avoid sanctions, and assuming that unless laws were coercive in this way, uh, we would be moved, moved or obliged to comply with them. But Schauer does take Austin's view, as he and Hart both, I claim, misunderstand it, to be roughly right, whereas Hart takes it to be wrong. That's as far as I go. <laughs> <coughs> Thank you, Michael. You are welcome to answer, Mr. Schauer. Okay, there is a lot there. Um, <laughs> Too um, much. <laughs> uh, much that I agree with, um, uh, and I'm certainly inclined to agree that, especially in terms of the distinction between um, uh, the objective and the subjective, the difference between um, motivating factors uh, and objective factors of the world, uh, about the world, you are basically right, uh, and I agree with that. Uh, I do think, however, uh, that one way of characterizing um, my views and maybe your views uh, in a way is we are both sympathetic with Austin, uh, but we may be sympathetic with Austin for different reasons. Um, that is, um, so uh, I think you have persuaded me that Austin is probably engaged more in a definitional project or a categ categorization project uh, than I would have given him credit for or than I did give him credit for. Uh, and that in addition, um, uh, Austin um, may have um, been engaged in a project of defining an enterprise uh, in ways that are different from what I gave him credit for. Indeed, um, 
Uh, one way of thinking about this is um, uh, there is a divide among those um, who do legal philosophy, a uh, 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 sort of ranking divide. Was the greatest um, legal, philosoph ing legal philosopher of the 20th century H.L.A. Hart, or was the greatest legal philosopher of the 20th century Hans Kelsen? Uh, so uh, uh, there may be other candidates, but that's a debate that some number of people think is interesting. Um, I think you shouldn't stick uh, with this. Hans century. Kelsen's um, <laughs> great work uh, uh, in German, Reinhard Rechsler, uh, in English, The Pure Theory of Law. And it may be important in understanding Kelsen to understand that when Kelsen said pure theory of law, he was not claiming that it was a theory of pure law, but rather an attempt to isolate a certain factor within the realm of a somewhat more complicated institution. Uh, one of the ways in which Michael seems to understand Austin, I now think he's right about this correctly, uh, makes Austin look a little bit more like Kelsen than we give him credit for, that is, Austin as trying to uh, isolate an area of inquiry rather than isolate something that exists by itself in the world. Uh, and I think all of that uh, is right. Um, now, one way of understanding what I think about um, Austin and force and threats and coercion and this cluster of things uh, is to suggest perhaps that at least for me, Austin may have been right if we understand him uh, through Hart's enterprise rather than through his own enterprise. So even if Michael is right that Austin was engaged in a different enterprise, let's suppose that Austin uh, was engaged in the enterprise that Hart thinks that Austin was engaged in. If Hart, Austin was engaged in the enterprise that Hart thinks that Austin was engaged in, even if Austin was, Hart was wrong in thinking that, uh, Austin may be still more right than we, uh, than we or Hart gave him credit for. Um, so uh, a brief diversion here, uh, one way of understanding that uh, goes back to a little bit of what Michael was saying uh, about essences and essentialism. Uh, so let me talk for a moment about birds. Um, so uh, birds fly, but not all birds fly. Um, uh, there are birds, uh, fully healthy, mature birds that do not fly. Uh, penguins and ostriches, most apparently. Uh, there may be a few others. Um, and therefore, the definition of a bird as a feathered vertebrate, which is the technical definition of a bird, um, does not include flying. And therefore, as a feathered vertebrate, uh, the definition of a bird uh, includes um, ostriches, uh, it includes penguins, and it does not include bats, although bats fly. Uh, now, let's suppose we were writing a book about birds. Imagine writing a book about birds, 300 pages or 400 pages or whatever, that said absolutely nothing about flying. We would think that the book was deficient precisely because it ignored an empirically dominant, even if not definitionally necessary, aspect of the enterprise. That's much the way in which um, I think guided by Austin, uh, I want to think about uh, law uh, in opposition to what Hart, th Hart thinks. That is that um, empirically, even if not definitionally, um, law may be an institution uh, substantially dominated um, by, um, broadly speaking, um, coercive institutions, broadly speaking, by sanctions, uh, broadly speaking, uh, by uh, the kinds of things that Austin referred to as evils. Uh, Hart <laughs> seems to think that that's not very important. 
uh, Hart thinks it's not very important because Hart says we can imagine institutions, rule-based institutions, uh, in which the participants internalize the rules, but there are no evils or sanctions or coercion, coercion involved. Uh, so Hart uses, to make his point, some number of sports and games. Frequently, he talks about cricket. Uh, nobody understands cricket, not even most of the English. Uh, so, uh, but we can think of a somewhat simpler um, example involving football. One of the interesting things about football from Hart's perspective is that it is possible for people to play football informally without referees, without anything other than um, uh, two people or four people or perhaps more uh, 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 substantially 22 people, if 22 people uh, decide in some field uh, we are going to play football, having agreed that they are going to play football more or less by the rules of football, they are going to be able to engage in a football game without referees, without penalties, without yellow cards, without red cards, without any of this. That's basically Hart's point, um, that um, participants in a rule system can engage in rule-governed behavior uh, without the evils, without the sanctions, and so on, and that that is possible. So then the question is, does that act, does, does my example of the backyard um, football game um, uh, or the um, country football game where you just draw um, up the pitch by putting items of clothing at each of the four corners and, le uh, let's, and say let's play football, does this accurately characterize the way in which law operates? Uh, not the way in which law necessarily operates, but in which, the, in which law ordinarily and typically operates in the same way that birds ordinarily and typically fly. Uh, so my view, therefore, is that in order to understand not the word law, not the concept of law, but the social phenomenon that it is law, so not the word, not the concept, not even the area of um, inquiry as so defined, but in order to uh, understand the social phenomenon of law, uh, we, have to un we have to think more seriously about punishment and sanctions and evils and so on than at least Hart um, would uh, have thought uh, important. Now, once we put it that way, we also have to understand that this is uh, exclu not exclusively, but at least substantially an empirical question. I don't see anything wrong with merging of the empirical questions uh, or addressing empirical questions informed by some philosophical uh, illumination. That's largely how I want to understand uh, what I am doing. Once we understand that it is um, uh, a partly empirical inquiry, then we can understand that things um, are uh, maybe different from legal system to legal system. Uh, so then we are led to the inquiry. Hart announces this but never investigates it. Hart operates on the assumption and says he is operating on the assumption that people typically, ordinarily, frequently obey the law just because it is the law? That's an empirical question. It is an empirical question whose answer varies from culture to culture. Uh, so one of the things I do when I travel uh, is I investigate uh, informally and casually what people do at traffic intersections, uh, pedestrians, not drivers. Um, so, um, oh, do there, the two are related. Uh, yeah, right. <laughs> uh, yes. So th there are um, <laughs> there are people in the world 
Uh, many of them are Americans. Many of them live in Southern Europe. Many of them live in other places. Uh, uh, who, when they see a sign that says, don't walk, treat it as uh, causally irrelevant to their behavior, uh, and they will walk or not walk depending on whether there are police officers um, or um, uh, other cars to be seen. In other places in the world, maybe here, even more, more commonly based on my observation uh, in many places in Finland, um, the Finns, if they see uh, a don't walk sign, if there is no car in sight, if there is no police officer in sight, will stand obediently at the corner and not walk in a way that would be unthinkable for a resident of New York or Naples. Uh, and if that's right, then it may turn out um, that a significant part um, of understanding the phenomenon of law is understanding the extent to which, as an empirical matter, people do or do not take the existence of law just because it is law as a reason for action. Uh, Hart believed, mistakenly in my view, that this is something common. Um, uh, I want to suggest that it may be less common than Hart believed, uh, that law as it ordinarily operates, just like birds ordinarily fly, law as it ordinarily operates uh, is unwilling to rely on people's obedience to law just because it is law and needs to back its sanctions, it needs to bank back its uh, commands, back its rules uh, with sanctions, uh, with orders, with threats, uh, and so on. In order to understand that, we have to engage in some philosophical inquiry, some empirical inquiry, some definitional inquiry, all inspired by Austin, uh, but as Michael correctly says, not Austin's enterprise, but inspired by Austin. <laughs> uh, and uh, <laughs> at that, I will stop uh, so we can stay moderately close to our original schedule. Thank you. <laughs> Yeah, here in Naka Naka Spurnigar, the shower at Little Carlson. Can I take this thing off? Because I can. My Tavish Kaish, like. Yeah, Queen of Sasla. I think. Uh, it illuminated it a bit for me. I can only speak for myself as a law student <laughs> because uh, both Austin and Hart, I think, s try to explain it in a different light, law. And I think that both of you <laughs> are right, <laughs> actually. So, but, but it depends on which light you see it in. Uh, but Mr. Schauer, I you think you, you understand what uh, Mr. Carlson, or Professor Carlson, it's called in English, right? Is trying to say. Mike. 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 <laughs> right. Yeah? Yes, no, I, I think that's right. Uh, so it may be use, I, I think you are right and you've asked the right question and it may be the appropriate inquiry um, into uh, at least mentioning yeah. that Hart's enterprise, unlike mine, which is quasi-empirical and quasi-philosophical, uh, and unlike Austin's, which might have been more rigorously definitional uh, and categorical, or categorial, uh, uh, Hart's enterprise, um, which may characterize at least some these days of uh, English language legal philosophy with Joseph Raz is probably the most uh, prominent practitioner these days, uh, is trying to say um, what, are, uh, what are the necessary properties of law in all possible legal systems in all possible worlds. Uh, it, Raz indeed even uses the metaphor uh, of 
would there be law in a society of angels? Mm. By which Roz means, would there be law in a society in which nobody was inclined to engage in bad behavior? There were no Willie Suttons. Uh, everybody wanted to do the right thing. Would we still need law? Uh, Roz, uh, Roz wants to say yes. Um, others want to say yes. But that's an enterprise um, that I understand to be different from mine, um, different from Austin's, uh, and I actually think different from Hart's, although Hart was of multiple voices about this. Uh, uh, the first chapter of Hart's concept of law, with which I have a great deal of sympathy, is largely methodological, largely comes out of the English jurisprudential tradition of the late 1940s through early 1960s that says, in effect, there are no essences. Mm. Um, uh, whether you get that from Wittgenstein on family resemblances or whether you get it from Max Black and John Searle on so-called cluster concepts, maybe the idea is that there are no essences. Uh, and if there, are, if there are concepts in the world with no essences, whose borders change, whose, defin whose, game, whose definitions change, like what Wittgenstein said about games, maybe the same thing is true about law, and maybe searching for the essence of law is a fool's errand. Yeah. Quite true. Well, thank you. Thank you. Uh, the next one on our list is Heine Uskorna. He is going to have, yeah, <laughs> he's going to talk about hate speech and holy prophets, how international hate speech laws can justify authoritarian, authoritarian uh, censorship norms. Um, do you see this, or sh it is, is it possible to turn off the light? Is that okay? I think it would be better to turn off the light. Um, thank you very much. Thanks for the presentation, Professor Mike Carlson, and thank you for the uh, very interesting reply. I really like that football analogy that I will copy and use in my own teaching. Um, and thanks for the organizers for organizing this event. It's an honor and a pleasure to be here. And thanks to uh, the students who have attended as well. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about my book that I published last year. It's, this is the book, Free Speech, Religion and the United Nations, The Political Struggle to Define International Free Speech Norms. It was published by Routledge University Press, and this is a revised and updated version of my PhD thesis that I accomplished at uh, King's College London, Department of War Studies in International Relations. So I don't have um, a legal background, but this is the, the boundaries between international relations and international law, basically. And um, I will touch upon some of the themes that are central to your expertise here, but I would really also like to engage the, the students as well. And I've de deliberately been thinking about that when I, when I prepared my slides. Okay, as the uh, title of this book hopefully indicates, um, uh, my uh, purpose or the, the central theme of this book is try to explore the ongoing tensions between free speech ideals on the one hand and religion, religious uh, sensitivities uh, on the other hand. A, a conflict which is as old as, as uh, history or as human beings. And I try to um, examine how this political struggle to define international law with regard to freedom of expression, with regard to freedom of expression and religion, uh, I try to uh, examine how this political conflict unfolds within the UN system. Um, what is the nature of this conflict? Who is saying what? Who is opposing? Uh, uh, or how is the international diplomacy 
uh, unfolding in practice. So my, my object of study is the state and my framework is the United Nations. Why did I choose the United Nations? Because the United Nations is the place, the arena where states, uh, all states in the world come together where they discuss um, you know, the, the meaning and the nature of international human rights law, the meaning, the nature and the implications of international norms such as democracy, human rights, gender equality, freedom of expression, etc., etc. And some of the uh, ongoing sources of political conflict within the UN system are as follows. What should international human rights law say about free speech, the limits of free speech, with regard to religion, but also with regard to a bunch of other questions about racism, for instance, and, uh, and hate speech, etc. How should existing human rights law be interpreted? Because, as noted just earlier, maybe there are no essences. Maybe everything is a matter of interpretation and reinterpretation, which is the ongoing political conflict in the UN system. Uh, should international law criminalize blasphemy? Blasphemy meaning to insult or mock or denigrate religion, religious symbols, religious doctrines, etc. And what is the meaning of hate speech, which is a very uh, contemporary um, uh, conflict or issue right now? Can international law against hate speech, can it, for instance, be used to criminalize uh, blasphemy, can it be used to justify the enforcement of blasphemy laws as these laws are enforced in many places throughout the world, not only in the Muslim majority world, but also uh, throughout uh, Catholic states in Africa, Catholic states in Latin America, and even certain European states such as Austria, uh, Poland, Greece, Italy, etc. So, in order to give you a little bit of background, um, I'm frequently asked when I have been presenting this book in, uh, in London or in, uh, in Copenhagen, so like, wh why did you, uh, why did you, um, what attracted you to this uh, subject? And one partial answer is that I worked as an MP, uh, sorry, as a secretary for an MP, which is very different from being an MP. <laughs> Magni Arkis here, he was an MP. I was only the secretary, not for him, but for another one. Uh, I worked in the Danish parliament when these 12 cartoons of the prophet Muhammad triggered the most uh, severe, most serious foreign policy crisis for the kingdom, kingdom of Denmark, maybe since um, World War II and Nazi occupation. 12 cartoons which resulted in burning embassies in Syria, Lebanon and Iran. Um, Danish goods were boycotted uh, throughout the Middle East and the North Africa, Asia. Uh, Denmark became uh, a target for militant groups uh, and the state of Denmark has had to, to spend billions of, of uh, Danish kroners in new security measures and not least some of the cartoonists here had to go underground and have been living underground with the bodyguards 24-7 ever since. Um, of course, this incident in 2005, or it started in 2005-06, is not new. The most um, famous example is probably the Rushdie affair, Salman Rushdie, an Indian-born British author, publishing the satanic verses which triggered mass violence and civilian deaths throughout the world and uh, Rushdie had to go underground after the supreme leader of Iran Ayatollah Khomeini issued a fatwa against Rushdie. A recent example is the Charlie Hebdo massacre in Paris where nine people were shot down uh, in January 2015 and we tend to think about laws against blasphemy, laws against apostasy. Apostasy meaning uh, to leave your faith, to abandon your religion. We may think about such laws, national laws, 
as artifacts of history that belongs to the Middle Ages, but actually in dozens of countries throughout the world, uh, these laws are actually, uh, they are on the books. We also have a blasphemy law in the Faroe Islands actually, but it's never used. But in this part of the world and in certain states in Europe, Latin America, Africa, these laws are actively used and and they are, they can, you know, trigger everything from small fines to imprisonment to torture and even the death penalty in some uh, countries. And one symbol of the uh, oppressive consequences of these laws is this guy, Raif Badawi, 37 years old today. He's a Saudi blogger uh, establishing a blog called Free Saudi Liberals. He was... Uh, he was uh, uh, arrested and convicted, six years, eight years in prison, a huge fine, and 600 public lashes uh, was, his, uh, was, his, was the court verdict. Uh, and I visited the place in Jeddah in Saudi Arabia, a public squ square where he has been punished. This is his wife who fled to Canada with the, the couple's three children and received political asylum. This is an amnesty campaign calling for the release of Raif Badawi. So I'm just highlighting this in order to, to um, communicate that, that uh, this is not just theoretical. These laws have real-world implications for real-world people out there in the real world. Um, the data that I've used is 25 interviews with UN diplomats from different corners of the world. I've been participating at UN meetings in Geneva and Saudi Arabia. And I've also been through some of the you know, UN archives in order to look at the historical debates. Because the, the question about free speech and the limits of free speech with regard to religion and with regard to racism and other issues has been around ever since the beginning of the United Nations. And then in order to uh, get more knowledge about how American diplomacy works in practice within the um, human rights uh, machinery in the United Nations. I've also been using the WikiLeaks database, which provides insight into how diplomacy works in practice in the field of um, the politics of human rights. And this is... Um, the theoretical background is something called the norm, norm theory in international relations, the norms literature, which um, addresses how international norms, a norm could be anything that governs state behavior, it could be gender equality, it could be LGBT rights, freedom of expression, democracy, whatever. How do these norms emerge in the first place? What is the pioneer country which is the first to give uh, women the right to elect, for instance, to, to participate in an election or whatever? How do international norms travel across borders? How do they spread? How do they diffuse? Uh, when do they reach a tipping point where a norm goes from being um, a marginalized um, value or principle into being a mainstream issue that all good countries need to, you know, uh, to embrace, at least pay lip service to. How do they travel across borders? But a criticism in my book about this literature is very much, you know, we Westerners are very preoccupied with how our norms spread across the rest of the world. But my case study is also a case study trying to examine how international norms, such as the right to speak freely about religious issues, how are they contested? How are they challenged? How are they undermined? How are they rolled back? Um, how are they reversed? And how are we to study um, such a fluffy, abstract, non-physical thing as a norm? Can we scientifically, you know, observe a norm? Um, and one thing that I, uh, one key theme uh, in my book is the role of the U.S. And I highlight this because Professor Frederick Schauer has written extensively about what is called American exceptionalism regarding both human rights in general, but also freedom of expression. And here is a quote 
very good quote. I wish it was mine, but it's not. <laughs> Understanding the spread and the non-spread of American free speech ideals cannot be separated from the complex international politics of American influence. And this is a quote by Professor Frederick Schauer in an article called The Exceptional First Amendment from 2005. And this captures very well what I try to do in my book to understand the spread and the non-spread of American free speech ideals, or you could say Western free speech ideals, um, which cannot be so separated from uh, the daily, the everyday mechanisms of international politics, uh, in this case within the UN uh, framework. A little bit of history. This is Eleanor Roosevelt, the first UN U.S. ambassador to the UN and the chief architect behind the Universal Declaration of Human Rights from 1948. Um, already at this point, if you go back, if you go into the archives and look at the historical debates taking place, everything is transcribed, so it's, it's, it's very interesting to go through the archives in Geneva. Uh, we have countries saying that the Universal Declaration of Human Rights should criminalize attacks on founders of religion. This is just one example. I think this was the Brazilian delegate at the time saying that, that we have uh, an article on freedom of expression, but we need to have uh, you know, uh, um, a longer article preventing attacks on founders of religion. And the Western countries opposed this, as well as the Soviet Union and China and other states. And um, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights was adopted with this article that is widely cited. Everyone has the right to freedom of opinion and expression. This right includes freedom to hold opinions, etc., etc. However, However, another article in this Universal Declaration is not very often cited when, uh, when we talk about free speech. Article 7 saying that all are entitled to equal protection, this is a limitation, all are entitled to equal protection against any discrimination in violation of this declaration and against any incitement to such discrimination. So, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights does not only have a granting clause, it, only, no, it, it also contains uh, an article uh, addressing hate speech, that all people are entitled to protection against incitement, which means in Faroese, also, um, sorry, just to <laughs> translate this word. So this was the first round of political struggle in the history of the UN when it comes to freedom of expression. And once this is adopted, a new round of struggle begins, the struggle to interpret, you know, what the hell this means in practice. How should this be implemented? What are the practical implications for real people out there? Um, after the adoption of the Universal Declaration, a new a uh, round of struggle began, which was very much characterized by the Cold War rivalry between America, uh, the US, and the Soviet Union. And during this period, uh, the UN Human Rights Commission, at is, as it was called at the time, started drafting another human rights convention called the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. The Soviet Union and its allies pushed for very broad censorship restrictions, and they used the hate speech concept in order to pass very broad, um, you know, um, uh, restrictions against the right to freedom of expression. While the U.S. was very much opposed, the U.S. stance was throughout this, uh, this period, the U.S. stance within the UN system was that the only expressions that, that we should, uh, that we should um, criminalize are concrete, direct, explicit uh, incitement to violence, likely to cause imminent lawless action, which is uh, something you know, embedded in, uh, in the jurisprudence of the Supreme Court. 
and Europe was somehow caught between these two positions. Europe found itself between a rock and a hard place because the European historical experience was Nazi Germany, the Holocaust, and the you know, verbal demonization of Jews uh, during the 30s in the Third Reich. This is a uh, front cover from Der Stürmer, a Nazi propaganda magazine, uh, portraying Jews week in and week out as, you know, the enemy, always with this slogan uh, below, Die Juden sind unser Unglück, meaning the Jews are our Unglück, our bad fortune, or how you could translate that. So European countries at this point adopted hate speech laws that are still in place in Denmark, in the Faroes, in almost all, as far as I know, all European countries that have hate speech laws. And these hate speech laws don't exist in the US. So what was the result of this political struggle? The result was that the Europeans uh, ended up siding with the, uh, with the Americans. Um, while the Soviet Union and a lot of non-Western countries were actually in majority and succeeded in, um, in adopting this hate speech paragraph in Article 22 in the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, saying that any advocacy of national, racial or religious hatred that constitutes incitement to discrimination, hostility, or violence, shall be prohibited by law. So this was a defeat for American free speech ideals. And this was a victory for the Soviet Union and the European countries, even though they themselves had adopted national hate speech laws in their domestic legislation, they voted against this specific uh, article. And Eleanor Roosevelt said afterwards that th from the UN pulpit that this article will only encourage governments to punish all criticisms in the name of protection against religious or national hostility. The commission, that is the Human Rights Commission in the UN system, must be careful not to include in the draft covenant any provision likely to be exploited by totalitarian states for the purpose of rendering the other articles null and void. So, in other words, uh, the US ambassador warned that uh, this paragraph will be exploited by totalitarian states. Um, and the European countries agreed, not, not because they didn't want to criminalize hate speech as such, but because they found this, um, this, the phrases, the formulations in this article as too broad and too easy to misuse for, you know, for anti-democratic or totalitarian purposes. All right, um, so th that was a little bit of background. This is my final part. Uh, my book addresses contemporary uh, free speech conflicts within the UN system. And I'm old enough to consider the 90s as contemporary. Um, in 1999, a new round of struggle began in the UN system when Pakistan and a lot of other Muslim-majority countries launched a UN resolution in the Human Rights Council in Geneva criminalizing, or sorry, calling upon states to criminalize what they called defamation of religions. Defamation law is usually uh, sorry, if I translate to Faroese again, it's here look at some ermayinga, ermayinga law, as a libel, slander, defamation. If I say that Barter has cheated in taxes, he can sue me, and I have the burden of proof, and I can be sued for defamation for hurting or undermining his repu his public reputation. But this is a new construct. This is a new formulation: defamation of religions. And the purpose was explicitly, from the beginning, to, to go from a non-binding resolution in the UN Human Rights Council to a new binding legal instrument in international human rights law. So this is a synonym for, for blasphemy. And this 
resolution was uh, adopted every year with a comfortable majority in the Human Rights Council from 1999 to 2010. And the EU couldn't do anything because it didn't have the political power. But then something happened. Uh, sorry, just, just a, a quick remark. The, the organization sponsoring this resolution is an, uh, is an, uh, is an, an alliance of Muslim-majority states called the OIC, the Organization of Islamic Cooperation, which is a powerful player, not when it comes to general international relations, it's torn apart, Shia, Sunni, the war in Syria, uh, but when it comes to human rights issues in, in, um, in the UN, such as free speech, freedom of religion, the situation for Christians and Jews, uh, LGBT rights, gender equality, abortion, etc. This is a powerful player in, um, in uh, the UN's human rights institutions. But in 2008, Barack Obama is elected uh, president of the United States. And after years of boycotting various UN institutions under George Bush uh, Jr., uh, John Bolton, if you remember him, he was the a U.S. ambassador to the U.N. at the time. The U.S., before Obama, boycotted the H Human Rights Council. And uh, after 2008, America re-enters many of these uh, 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 human rights uh, or U.N. institutions, including the, uh, the Human Rights Council. And immediately, as, as is visible when you go through the WikiLeaks database, you can see that the State Department, Hillary Clinton, becomes the new um, uh, Minister of Foreign Affairs. The U.S. is launching a, a, a multilateral campaign to undermine this resolution, uh, condemning and criminalizing defamation of religions, because the new U.S. administration perceives this resolution as going against Western free speech ideals, American free speech ideals, and we need to do something about this. So they are instructing uh, ambas ambassadors throughout the world to target countries and persuade them or pressure them not to vote in favor of this resolution. And you can see that it's a combination of stick and carrot, you know, because the U.S. has a lot of leverage. Uh, the U.S., it's easy to say to a weak African state that how much aid do we give you every year? Okay, if you keep on voting in favor of this resolution, we will cut, we will reconsider our uh, financial aid to tackle Ebola virus in Western Africa or something like that. So this is a case of how, you know, hum international human rights politics is also a matter of brute power politics as well, where the strong um, can push and influence the weak. So, and this is Aileen Donahoe, American ambassador to the UN, who was very active against this resolution. I interviewed her for my PhD. And in 2010, um, uh, the resolution was somehow, how do you say, put to bed. It, was, um, it wasn't voted, it wasn't adopted after that. The result is that the OIC has somehow redefined its strategy without abandoning the goal to criminalize blasphemy, to criminalize blasphemous expressions. The OIC has gradually, not from one day to another, but gradually abandoned a religious discourse, you know, ref uh, referring to Sharia law or uh, cultural particular particularities or something, they are uh, growingly justifying their policies on the basis of secular, liberal, international human rights law. Basically using the hate speech paragraph that I showed you earlier, which criminalizes incitement to hostility, incitement to discrimination, hostility, and violence. So the new uh, here, is, here is a statement from 89, where an OIC diplomat in the UN system is saying that this novel, The Satanic Verses, written by Salman Rushdie, is punishable under the Sharia. 
was a perfectly common argument to hear back then. Today, when the OIC was condemning the Danish cartoons, they said that the cartoons violate international human rights law. So you can see how, um, how the, uh, your way of talking is changing, although your policies uh, are, you know, are the same throughout uh, the decades. So today, the argument is that defamation of religion or blasphemy, criticizing God, criticizing religious doctrine, is an act of hate speech and therefore in violation of international human rights law. It's an act of racism. It's a manifestation of discrimination or intolerance. It undermines peace and stability in the world. It violates freedom of religion. Um, so one of the conclusions in my book is to see how you know, how uh, we have reached a phase in the UN system where practically everybody, even Saudi Arabia, Iran, North Korea, etc., speak the same language and justify their policies on the basis of international human rights law. Um, and this is something that I call internal norm contestation. In the theoretical uh, literature, External norm contestation if you s is, um, uh, is when you say that we don't like freedom of expression. We don't accept it. It's not part of our national culture, national politics, or whatever. Internal norm contestation means that you embrace a norm, but at the same time, you redefine the meaning of the norm in question. You seek to you know, renegotiate what it means to respect and promote freedom of expression. And this is, some, this is an ongoing political process and conflict. I think I will end there, even if I have, um, I will end with, with uh, uh, just a brief quote, uh, sorry, just a brief point on the European Court of Human Rights. Because the European countries, they are criticizing the enforcement of blasphemy laws within the UN system. And they are pointing fingers when you, when you um, um, hear the sessions in the Human Rights Council. However, at the same time, there have been many um, uh, cases in the European Court of Human Rights in Strasbourg justifying the use of European blasphemy laws. Uh, Austria is one example which has on several occasions, you know, convicted individuals of blasphemy. Individuals have applied to, uh, to try the case at the European Court of Human Rights and the European Court of Human Rights concludes that uh, there may be some legitimate state objectives to use and enforce blasphemy laws uh, on the basis of the European Convention on Human Rights. Some of the um, arguments within these um, court rulings, if you go through them, is that it is a legitimate aim for, us, for a democratic state to protect religious and social peace. It's a legitimate state aim to protect religious feelings, which comes under, which comes under the rights of others, as, uh, as it says in the European Convention on Human Rights. It's, uh, it can be justified on the basis of protecting religious freedom because it is my religious freedom not to have my dearest beliefs and feelings insulted and mocked and disrespected all the time. Uh, it is a legitimate state aim to prevent justified indignation among the faithful. And these court uh, verdicts are being used in the UN system I mean, the, the diplomats uh, representing the embassies from, you know, Egypt, uh, Pakistan, etc. these are not like extremists. These are top legal uh, scholars from the best universities in the West. And they are reading these statements and they are using them within the UN system to justify the active use of blasphemy laws throughout the world. I think I will end there. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, well, the time is now about 25 minutes past two. 
So uh, the schedule is back on point. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, uh, Professor Schauer, you have about 15 minutes or so to answer. Sorry, I need a paper to write down all the good stuff that will come now. You don't need it, that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so um, I learned a lot from this, uh, and uh, uh, so rather than disagree, let me mm. elaborate uh, on some number of things. Uh, I think the thing, the one thing I may disagree with uh, um, is the number of times um, in which you said uh, something to the effect of, as I wrote it down, the American approach uh, mm. or maybe the Western approach. Exactly. Uh, it may be important to emphasize the difference between them, and I say that from the perspective of someone who is not particularly sympathetic with the approach of my own country. Uh, nevertheless, it may be a mistake um, to underestimate the differences between the American approach and the approach in the other liberal industrialized uh, democracies uh, in the world on a number of topics. Blasphemy, um, there might be more similarity. Um, uh, on others, there are differences. Uh, libel, defamation, which you mentioned, may be one of them. Um, so um, it turns out that under American law since 1964, um, people can be punished, rarely criminally, but uh, more likely with a fine in a civil lawsuit. People can be punished for uh, libeling or slandering a public official or a public figure only if they can, only if the person who has been um, libeled can not only prove beyond a reasonable doubt that what was said was false, but can prove beyond a reasonable doubt that the person who said it knew it was false at the time that he or she said it. That is a virtually impossible burden of proof, um, and one consequence of this is uh, uh, to a rough approximation, libel and slander law has disappeared in the United States in, in ways that it has not in much uh, of the rest of the world. Now, this, um, this is also an interesting example um, of what you referred to as the non-spread of norms. Yes. So the American approach to libel um, has um, a lot of enthusiastic supporters throughout the world. Uh, the name for those enthusiastic supporters throughout the world is journalists. Uh, that is, journalists throughout the world think that the American approach to libel is wonderful. Uh, the reason that I mention this is that journalists are not without international influence. They, they are not without international opportunities to speak to each other. And one consequence of that is that the American approach, which I'll refer to as an extreme approach um, to libel, has been actively promoted before courts and law reform commissions throughout the world with no success. Uh, uh, that is, um, there are judicial opinions of the highest courts in Australia, in New Zealand, um, in Canada, uh, in the UK, in Argentina, in India, and a number of other places, all saying explicitly, we have been urged to follow the US in this regard, we refuse to do so. Uh, explicit non-spread, and one lesson that we might draw from this, or at least one hypothesis that we might test that comes out of this, is does the spread of an international norm require at least some baseline level of compatibility? That is, um, does it require that there be at least some similarity, and if there is some similarity, then the spreader nation may have a better opportunity to get a toehold than if there is not that similarity. 
So it may be that the American approach, uh, at least to libel uh, and slander, is so much of an outlier um, that despite uh, efforts uh, in other countries by journalists and others, um, uh, the, we've seen the non-spread precisely because it was simply too different. Mm -hmm. uh, now, that's a different phenomenon from the phenomenon um, that I tried to capture in that thing that you quoted from me uh, and the, uh, in much of what you were talking about uh, illuminatingly uh, about the UN and everything else. Much of this uh, is about, uh, or part of this, is about international alliances and, inter and foreign policy that may be independent of the underlying substantive issue. Uh, so, um, uh, it turns out, um, uh, to, I'm about to say something that somebody might say you're wrong about this and I don't know very much about it so I'm going to guess, but feel free to tell me that I'm wrong based on my limited amount of knowledge. Uh, I'm going to talk about the business and corporation law for a moment in Estonia. Uh, uh, a subject about which, more or less, to a first approximation, none of us knows anything. Uh, but one of the interesting things about Estonian corporation law um, is that it was part of a very large number of legal transformations in Estonia in the very early 90s, once Estonia once again became a nation independent of the Soviet Union. Um, now, Estonia, uh, a small country, not as small as this one, but a pretty small country, did not have the local legal or financial resources to draft highly complicated technical uh, financial and business laws right at the beginning, so they had to be a borrower nation. Mm -hmm. Lots of countries wanted to be lender nations. Uh, there were lots of countries throughout the world that wanted to try to get Estonia to adopt some version uh, of their own laws. It turns out that Estonia largely copied its business and corporation laws from Germany. They did so uh, not because they thought those laws were better than other laws, but the most important thing in Estonia in 1991 was becoming a member of the European Union. Um, they were willing, and some people put it this way, they were willing to accept laws that might have been less optimal from their point of view just in order to increase the compatibility with a legal regime that they thought correctly at the time was the most important country uh, in the international organization that was most important to them. Um, we've seen this in lots of areas, uh, including uh, here, um, on a number of issues, uh, including issues of hate speech. Um, there is a divergence between Canada and the U.S. Um, Canada has hate speech laws uh, in a quite prominent case called Keegstra that goes back probably almost 20 years. Um, the Supreme Court of Canada um, allowed the kinds of hate speech laws that do not exist and cannot uh, exist in the U.S. Um, uh, there are a number of reasons for that. One, um, Canada has a deeper norm, perhaps a deeper norm of equality and a shallower norm of uh, individual freedom uh, than the U.S. And when those two conflict, as they do with respect to hate speech, um, the Canadians uh, prefer the one most conducive to equality. But also, Canadians are very sensitive to being thought of as the 51st United, 51st state of the United States. Uh, and because this is a big deal for Canada, as well it should be, um, uh, very often they try to um, take a legal direction that differentiates them uh, from the U.S. just because the differentiation is important. Mm -hmm. Conversely, if you look at um, the judicial opinions from the Republic of Ireland, you will discover that 
judicial opinions from the Republic of Ireland, uh, a country whose legal roots are English common law, those judicial opinions are likely to be heavy on citations to American law and light on citations to English law. Uh, this has nothing to do with whose law is better or worse. It has a lot to do with Irish views about the English uh, and for, for Americans, for, for better or for worse, from the perspective of the Republic of Ireland, have the advantage of not being England uh, or not being the UK. Uh, so this is an example, at least, of the kind of sort of non-substantive factors um, that may um, relate to all of this. So let me just say a, t a little bit about your final examples um, um, uh, uh, in which you talked about um, what in technical European law language uh, is the margin of appreciation. Yeah. How much will international organizations, how much will international human rights uh, laws uh, allow for regional uh, variation or allow for variation uh, among nations? Um, uh, and obviously, blasphemy is one of the topics that's being contested um, about this. Uh, and it seems clear that that, that form of contest uh, is not only about the margin of appreciation, but is also, as you properly suggest, about questions um, of equality, but also about questions of whether we think about speech as a harmless act. Mm -hmm. There is a long tradition in many Western countries and in much of the Western literature uh, of thinking that freedom of speech ought to be put in the same category as freedom of personal action and freedom of personal behavior on the theory that freedom of speech is just an exercise of personal liberty not harming other people and however you feel about the right to engage in activities that don't harm others, you ought to feel that way about free speech. There's a very long literature uh, dominating most of the 20th century that takes that view. It's false. Uh, and the other side of that view is that speech is, in the language of political theory, an other regarding act. Um, speech is, uh, we speak for the purposes of affecting other people. Speech can be and often is uh, harmful or more harmful than certain forms of physical contact. Uh, if I light you, if I lightly punch you in the uh, in the shoulder, uh, you have a cause of action at law, uh, despite the fact that the harms are minimal. Uh, many people think that speech in general. Um, um, is of a different category than physical contact. Much of the current debate is about a transformation in, let's call it, free speech sensibilities that recognizes that words can harm, uh, and if words can harm, uh, not just by harming reputation, after all, the French for, hundred, French for, the French for hundreds of years have had a cause of action for insult. I don't know whether that is the case here or not, but there is a cause of action for insult in French law. That is, what you say to a person, even if there is no audience, can be actionable even if what, only what you have done is talking or saying. Um, um, so the, many of the current debates, including now in the last 15 or 20 years, debates about making the US less sympathetic to hate speech than it has been in the past are about the recognition, perhaps initially inspired by the feminist anti-pornography movement, uh, more recently inspired by some number of hate speech incidents uh, that have recognized that although the US, as you correctly say, uh, has traditionally had uh, no permissible laws, none, period, zero, no permissible laws against hate speech in any form, that's now an area of more active contest. Uh, very little of this in the US is about religion. 
uh, blasphemy remains in a different category. Uh, but on issues relating to race and gender and sexual orientation, there's now an active debate in the US in ways that there weren't um, 20 or 30 um, or 40 years ago. Uh, and maybe a little bit of this uh, is the phenomenon that you have just been describing. That is, many of those who are arguing for increased tolerance of hate speech laws in the US are increasingly drawing on uh, the laws in other countries, increasingly drawing on some of the UN documents um, that you mentioned and the like uh, in support of their claim. After all, the, uh, at the moment, the mainstream American political liberalism, that is the, the mainstream position of the American left is to be more international. Uh, and if it is to be more international, then many have argued that it ought, U.S. ought to be more international um, uh, in terms of free speech kinds of values. Uh, and um, many European examples are commonly used uh, in support of the argument that the U.S. ought to be more restrictive of hate speech than it now is. Many of these arguments, unfortunately, don't recognize that Europe, Europe is not one monolithic entity. Um, and that, uh, as I mentioned in a class uh, two days ago, um, talking a little bit about the Danish cartoons and a little bit about Charlie Hebdo, uh, it is a mistake to assume that the approach in uh, Denmark um, or even in the UK um, is as, uh, let's call it intolerant in the non-pejorative sense, is as intolerant as the approach in France or Austria uh, or some number of other countries. Uh, and at least on many hate speech questions, um, uh, Europe is not a monolithic ent entity. So I learned a lot, thank you, and I will stop at this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, have a nakar nakan spurning till anten heinskorne, or do you have a question for Frederick Schauer? Nein, ein, ja. Just a quick comment about uh, the Paris blasphemy law. It it, um, it has been used. To, uh, from 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 I think the years of seventy two to two thousand eight, we had a a film censorship board, and uh, the blasphemy law has been used to justify banning uh, some films to be viewed by uh, by the public. And I know two two examples. Those are Life of Brian and the Last Temptation of Christ. I just wanted to point that out. Yeah, it is. I mean, uh, that's interesting. Uh, I didn't know about that. Uh, I do know that uh, to some extent, even still, um, Canada retains a film censorship board. Um, uh, and there has been a longstanding view, uh, whether this is now obsolete in the era of the internet, but there was a long-standing view that motion pictures are different and therefore far more likely to be harmful than other forms of speech, uh, which is why some jurisdictions, um, Canada, as I said, one that I know, have been willing to have film censorship long after they eliminated all forms uh, of other censorship. These debates uh, in the era of the internet may now be a little bit uh, obsolete, uh, but uh, they exist. Uh, uh, it's also interesting um, related to this. Uh, we can ask about who's doing the censoring. We think about, when we think about free speech, we think about governments. Um, the, um, the most newsworthy censorship event of the last month uh, has been the exposure of the fact that Microsoft took down from its platform all pictures of the Tiananmen Square um, uprising. Uh, they originally said it was a mistake. Uh, 
but the only mistake was taking it down from its non-China platform. They have yeah. not said it was a mistake to remove from its platform um, available in China all references to Tiananmen Square. Uh, so it, um, the, uh, obviously Microsoft, for better or for worse, thinks that its bottom line is more important than its, uh, than its commitment to principle. Um, but especially in the internet era, uh, the role of private economic pressure may be something we can't ignore when we think about all of this. Just one brief comment on that. I, we're probably out of time, but thanks for, for the comment on <laughs> the use of Faroese blasphemy law. I think the paradox in Europe is that more and more countries have abandoned their national blasphemy laws, particularly after uh, Charlie Hebdo in Paris. Countries like Iceland, Denmark, Norway repealed their blasphemy laws after 2015. But I think at the same time, it's very interesting that you say that the public opinion in the US might be approaching the, the hate speech uh, tradition in Europe, at least to a certain extent. Yeah, not, not so much about blasphemy, no, more but hate about speech. Ra race. Yeah. Yeah, 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 hate speech with regard to race or gender or yeah. sexual identity yes, or something right. else. That could have a long-term effect with regard to the spread and the non-spread of international free speech norms. Yeah. And I think it's a very relevant point uh, when you mentioned uh, Microsoft and uh, Tiananmen Square that Today, I mean, we are just um, uh, preparing a new book, an, an anthology about free speech issues in the 21st century, and basically the state is not very relevant today. It's obsolete compared to the tech giants. I mean, yeah. Google and Facebook and, uh, and those corporations that are basically controlling the global conversation. So that's much more, that's what, uh, what the future with regard to free speech and hate speech and all these issues will, will be all about. Uh, how to control the tech giants and whether it's possible to control them at this point. Bifa Taka and Lutland Steg will take a break uh, for about 15 minutes, then we'll be back. Thank you. That was interesting. No, that was great.
uh, we're just going to start again. Our next uh, presentation is by Bar Lashen, and he's going to talk a bit about rules and standards, standards and the corona management. Uh, this uh, title has uh, maybe some exag exaggeration in it, because I will not deal very much with the corona management, but I think I will use some uh, observations of mine uh, in during this corona crisis to uh, illustrate my some some basic views about uh, legal norms or rules or or the opposition between rules and standards do you hear me all right i cannot hear you i cannot hear myself very good i'm just asking yeah um, and um, professor shower has written extensively about legal norms and how to classify them into uh, rules and uh, standards, and uh, also has dig dug very far into uh, the nature of rules themselves, which is uh, which is an academic uh, exercise that one not that often see uh, will see in Europe. Uh, so that is why it is especially interesting, and. <coughs> It is in the Schauer's book from uh, 2009, Thinking Like a Lawyer. He reflects uh, in, uh, in, in one chapter about uh, uh, legal uh, directives classified as rules and standards. And he calls uh, the classification as a, a, a distinction of central importance to law. And uh, that is, uh, I hope that the students uh, can agree with us on this, that we share, we share that opinion. And we have tried in our legal education to uh, uh, be pretty, use a lot of time on rules and standards and also on rules themselves. And also on principles. Sometimes principles are classified as norms, but I guess that is debatable. They can probably also be classified as a kind of other vague background uh, legal source. But that's not going to be the topic of uh, this discussion. And in that citation, uh, Schauer says that uh, the, f the language of legal standards it uses language as best interest, the unreasonable, and it's broad, vague, general, and imprecise. And then the second group, that is the rules. They are more. Uh, sharp edged, uh, have more sharp edge to them, more than 20, unglazed white paper, they are detailed, specific, concrete, and determinate. And traditionally, they are called uh, the difference between precise rules. Oh, so am I repeating too much here? Oh, okay, let's take the last one. The dis this distinction appears everywhere, and no discussion of legal reasoning would be complete without a careful consideration of this central important distinction. Yeah. Um, um, yeah, and we can probably go a bit farther into uh, the rule category of norms called rules. Um, even if, uh, as Schauer also emphasizes, uh, this is more of a continuum than a, an, an, an either or, uh, you have a you have a, a one extreme with uh, with the ruleness of a norm, and you have another extreme with standardness, to use that language, and uh, then you have a lot of uh, a scale there in between where you can have more of a standard approach and more of a rule approach. Uh, but one of those very important uh, uh, markers of a, a rule is that the rules rule is uh, determining the facts prior. The rule maker or the leg legislator is determining the facts, so the decision maker is, he does not have um, much of a say in the decision, he has to go and apply the value, cho value choices that are made beforehand by the rule maker or the legislator. So rules can also be said to block a decision maker from access to the deeper purpose or deeper rationale of the norm. You're only supposed to apply the, the rule and not to ref reflect on its deeper rationale. I guess it can be debated, people disagree on this, but that is uh, a, a point. Uh, theft in the, our criminal law is a classical uh, rule. 
I mean, I guess there can be situations where one can be in doubt, but uh, very often it is pretty clear what is theft. You take a movable object from uh, the possession of somebody else with the intent of enriching yourself or others. And uh, then if that can be proved in the court of law, you are, are guilty of theft. And you can go to an even more uh, uh, clear or, or a norm with even more ruleness to it, that only persons of 18 years of age or older can get a driver's license to a traditional motor car, a traditional car, or a, what they call now a big motorcycle that is probably the, a real mo motorcycle as opposed to a, a moped or what they call it in English. In both cases, but uh, more clearly the latter, the decision maker only needs a simple su subsumption, needs to subsume the facts under the general rule, and then the application of law is just at hand. There's nothing much more to do. And why do we have rules? Uh, that is an interesting question, I also think. Uh, uh, this uh, theorist here is uh, referring to Adam Smith, who reflected deeply on the nature of rules. And Adam Smith said, I, I guess he must not have been the first one. Mike can help us if what Aquinas or Aristotle have said on the issue. But our lack of time and resources, we cannot make reasoned judgment all the time. We need to depart from that and fix action according to some uh, rule. But also, and this is very important in the Western legal tradition, because humans are driven by passions, mostly before an act is going to happen. You are driven by passion to such an extent that you will be hindered to uh, act uh, impar impartially or disinterested or, uh, yeah, and you're, you have a egoistic or illegitimate motive or, or no, no, not a motive necessarily, but you will have a, you will be, be dragged uh, off track in an uh, illegitimate way because of your passions. And uh, law as reason, tradition, back to the natural law tradition, is very much about that, how, uh, how, uh, how law is supposed to guard yourself, guard the fallible human nature against its passions. Um, yeah, as uh, Suri Ratnapala says, because referring to Adam Smith, because uh, humans have an insight or a recognition of their uh, fa fallible nature, they are ne nevertheless uh, rational enough to have a, have a means to counter that, and the means countering that is rule-making and rule-following. And we do that all the time. We don't do that only in law, in a formal, formal uh, legal system. We also do that in everyday life. We, we, have, we have time, time uh, deadlines for, for, uh, for meals and uh, some people for vacations. We, we reduce chaos and we reduce judgment to uh, those uh, sticking points of coordin coordinating our behavior. Friedrich Hayek said that this was the uh, secret of the success of the human race. Man is as much a rule-following animal as a purpose-seeking animal, he said so in his uh, uh, first volume of uh, Law, Legislation and Liberty. And uh, I guess that I, those, uh, his theorizing reminds me a lot of of Frederick Schauer's uh, theorizing on, on uh, rules. And then you have uh, standards. They go, even if we talk in principle about a continuum rather than a, a, a difference in kind, uh, they occupy uh, or they go in a different direction. And uh, the rationale with the standard is that the decision maker has access to the background lying purpose or justification of the, of the norm. Therefore, a, a, a norm is often only uh, the, the, the norm maker, not rule maker now, but the norm maker or the legislator is only communicating a vague description of the relevant facts to the 
decision-making authority. So in a, a kind, you, uh, in a way, one has, one is delegating decision-making competence to the administrator, judge, or police officer, or prosecuting office, or wh whom it might be. And we all know a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, legal uh, standards. Authority, authorities must be focusing on implementing solutions that are in the best interest of the child, says the Ferris Law on Child Protection, Article 1. Or the classic one, uh, uh, Danish, uh, now under Ferris authority, but original Danish law on contracts. A contract ca can be declared invalid in whole or in part if it shall be deemed unfair or not in accordance with proper conduct to enforce it. So that is, uh, you get the picture, that is uh, a standard as opposed to a norm. Uh, I'm sorry, a, 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 a rule. And <clears throat> some people are ideological about the rule versus standard distinction, while others are less so. But I guess that regardless of that issue, one can say that there are certain classical areas of legislation that are uh, where standards has something to, to them. And on the other side, there are other areas where rules have more sympathy. Techn technical complexity and or danger will be natural something that triggers our, our uh, rule instinct. Traffic on land, even if there is a, an exception to that in Montana where they once had uh, a, a norm of uh, driving according to a prudential uh, behavior or something like that. Uh, but uh, that is often mentioned as a funny example because I guess most countries agree on uh, having traffic regulation rule, rule kind. Sea and air, nuclear energy, one should probably not have uh, all things considered assessment in the, in the, in the laboratory of the nuclear plant. And fighting pandemics, as I will come back to, is also probably one of those areas that are, I will come back to the next slide. But also, if, the, if, if one is, has reason to uh, question the legitimacy of the state, uh, rules will be, uh, will be the natural, uh, natural choice. And criminal law, even if there are standards in criminal law, one. Uh, prefers to have uh, clear-cut rules so that uh, you know what the, you know what the mandate the state has gotten in terms of getting getting you for for misconduct and um, taxation also you also have vague norms of taxation but that is also a uh, classical intrusion into private sphere so one would think that standards are not of the pre 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 of a preference. But standards are preferred in the context when general categorization is either impossible or difficult or even just costly. Child protection, uh, as I referred to earlier. If one were to, to cut out general categories for uh, when to remove a child from a dysfunctional family, one would have a lot of uh, maybe under-enforcement and over-enforcement, uh, the, the norm would at least be shooting imprecisely to such an extent that it would be come across as unacceptable. And human rights law, uh, also even if Americans have a tradition for categorization, it is classic in the European Convention of Human Rights and the International Covenant on, on, on the Civil and Political Rights that uh, one is uh, applying these laws, this, these uh, provisions as uh, not absolute rights, but relative rights that can be balanced against counter rights uh, counting in the other direction or other values counting in the other direction. So uh, that will also be, standards will also be hu important for human rights. And unacceptable conduct in business relations. A categorical or rule approach to that is e not easily imagined and would also probably create a law that is not well, uh, well suited. But then you can also have rules and standards that are pretty more neutral or uh, where, uh, where people don't have an ideological opinion about it or where the uh, uh, regulation, uh, topic of regulation is not such that it uh, points in the direction of the either or the other choice. 
For example, access to higher education in Scandinavia have often been very rule, uh, rule uh, favoring rules. You have to have a bachelor education or you cannot get in to that higher education. You have to have a gymnasial education or you cannot pass, while the Americans and the British often have had a more case-by-case uh, -case analysis and a rule approach. Age-related retirement on the labor market used to be uh, here, here, around here to be very fixed on the rules, but it is loosening up somewhat. And Americans, as we have been discussing, uh, have not, uh, we've discussed it privately, have not had a, have, have had a more uh, liberal or, I, I don't know if I can say, standard approach for that. But I guess that even in America, one is not uh, happy to sit in back of a plane with a, <laughs> with a very old pilot because he can, he can be one of those with a weakness, hard weakness that is not uh, testable or, or cannot be caught in a medical examination. And so one is uh, employing rules as a precautionary, precautionary measure for, for, for uh, protecting one against that. I guess that surgeons uh, will, will probably count uh, in the same direction. Uh, so uh, rules are necessary and, uh, uh, and useful and they are actually hardwired in us. We instinctively are rule creators and rule, rule followers, but they come at a cost. Rules come at a cost. Uh, as uh, HLA Hart, that has been discussed earlier, he had also some very interesting reflections on uh, nature of generalization and open texture of language. He, sa he says at some point in the concept of law that uh, uh, when the rule maker, of course, is not omniscient, uh, we are bound to, uh, we, we, we are bound to uh, suffer this imprecision of aim and uh, over-inclusion over and under-inclusion. So, of course, many people in the Faroe Islands that are only 70 years old would be perfectly fitted, uh, both technically and morally, to drive a car, but they will not be allowed. We have over-inclusion. And some 90 years old, probably less likely that they not have the technical skills, but more, maybe their moral maturity is a problem, but they will nonetheless have access to the driver license. So we have under-inclusion. And uh, paraphrasing, uh, showers, uh, uh, story about the perfect car and clear weather in one of his speeches. If you have a 30-year-old driver in a BMW, a sunny day in the Faroes, that is, as Shower already know, pretty unlikely. <laughs> uh, he's still not allowed to go over 80 kilometers an hour. We can have over-inclusion. Okay, people might, might disagree on that, but I would think that we have over-inclusion. I don't know what you think. <clears throat> and the recent pandemic. In a context of a pandemic like the COVID-19, um, administrators or policymakers, they are frightened. They, they, have, they face a situation where they have uh, a lack of, uh, of time and knowledge and uh, probably also human resources to uh, make adaptive uh, or, or, or situation adapted uh, uh, solutions. That would count in favor of choosing rules over standards as public directives. And that is exactly what we have been experiencing, that uh, we have had a very much of a rule approach. So uh, someone, somebody, somebody might say or, or uh, protest that uh, our the Faroese lockdown was not uh, based on binding law. But I don't think that is relevant for this discussion because uh, also uh, informal uh, norms are, 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 are uh, kind of on a, in a relevant way to classify as nor standards and, and rules. And I can, I can accept that this uh, context makes it rational and legitimate to... to uh, oh, oh, no, I thought that was about uh, the classification rule. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, go back again. This situation also makes it reasonable to employ expertise. I mean, you don't have time, you don't have knowledge. What do you do? You ask the wise people or the, the competent people what to do. So it is natural and legitimate for policymakers and administrators to employ ex experts. 
But here, here I come closer to my point. I think uh, it might be prob uh, relevant to see who is an expert, who counts for, as an expert, and for what purposes. <clears throat> Our affair with rulemaking, I was just saying that we have been inclined towards rules and over-inclusion. And I think uh, we have been going pretty heavy in that direction. For example, uh, uh, where is that here? Okay, okay, I was too fast now. I'm sorry, I have to back, back again. <clears throat> we were uh, three researchers from uh, the Ferrix University who uh, asked for public access in the Ferrix administration about all that materials, uh, 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 no, regulating uh, where, when the regulation happened in March 2020 and onwards. And uh, in all the materi materials that I have uh, been reading through, uh, there has not been very much discussion. There has been discussions about economy and, and, uh, and likelihood of uh, the elderly uh, unnecessarily catching the, this disease and dying and all that. But there has not been very much discussion about uh, uh, the principle of proportionality or balancing or, or, or any language that can be interpreted as uh, capturing the rule versus uh, standard distinction. Well, there has been one uh, paper from the Ferrox Ethics Committee, uh, but that Ferrox Ethics Committee was so afraid of, uh, of, of flashing its uh, views and disturbing the authorities that they only, they only uh, communicated this to uh, one uh, of our uh, ministers, not, 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 not priests, uh, so, I mean, admin, what is the minister? Uh, Government ministers, and it came out in, or in an informal ma uh, manner la later that maybe you might know about. Uh, and in that uh, in that document, the ethics committee is uh, is uh, citing a UN uh, a, a w, uh, World Health Organization uh, document that fleshes out all these dilemmas from 2016 about the principle of proportionality and uh, assess, assessing uh, the, the proportionality of the rule approach, obviously. Um, yeah, so uh, I'm speculating maybe that, uh, that this uh, lack of any documentation about uh, the dark side of rules might, might be an explanation of why we were pretty harsh in the pharaohs. For example, in the island Santoy, there was, in the early period, spring 2020, there was no incident. And in Suroy, uh, the island farther south, there were three incidents. But regardless, uh, funerals that are so, uh, I, I would classify that as a natural law uh, principle, having a, a right to a traditional funeral even if, if, even if it's not part of any human rights documents. The reason why it's not a part of any human rights document, I believe, is because it is so fundamental that it even transcends uh, the imagination of people coming to think about that. But of, co of course, uh, the articles in the European Convention on Human Rights in, uh, in second, Section 2 that have uh, all those legitimate aims that ca you can counter rights on basis of, they of course mention public safety and health and, and what have you. So, so you have a, somewhat a kind of clashes between absolutes, one would think. But I don't, I don't think that in an area of the country where there's no virus, that it is unproblematic to only allow 10 people and obviously not covering the whole family to attend a funeral in a traditional church, and also applying a one-size-fits-all, large and small churches alike. And the same goes with family uh, locked out of elderly homes in a situation like that. I don't know if one could imagine a legal standard approach, but I think that one could at least imagine a more complicated set of rules, sub-rules, to, uh, to uh, counter or, or, or make, uh, make up for those uh, special situations. Yeah. But on the other hand, I am also open to uh, the interpretation that it might be rational to have very, very simple rules, as simple rules are easier to communicate, are easier to uh, get people to follow, so they probably are more efficient as coordinating devices, maybe. I don't know. 
so it might be what I touched upon earlier, the perceived inability of complex rules to, no, I didn't, I did touch on this, lack of time and human resources. And probably also some instinct tells us that complexity is a problem for fast uh, coordination of behavior, probably, I don't know. But if that was so, why do the documents not testify such assessments? Or is it just a matter of uh, intuition or instinct? And if it is a deliberate choice, uh, are we as citizens in a democratic society not entitled to get, uh, get a notice or get, an in, uh, get, get included in this rationale uh, or, or motive at the authority level? They could say things like that. Uh, I know that we are over including, we know that we are over including. Uh, this is. Uh, this is touching a lot of people that probably needn't be touched by this, but we don't have the time, we don't have the human resources to do it otherwise. I think that might be, might be uh, rational. W yeah, that was the guideline I was uh, talking, about, talking about. And <coughs> uh, how much time have I used? Uh, okay. And I would like to end with uh, Professor Schauer's uh, reflection again in the same chapter in the book of Thinking Like a Lawyer, combined with a page and uh, a lengthier note 25, where uh, he has this interesting observation on the technique or probably expertise of rulemaking. Entire books could be written about the techniques of rulemaking. Surprisingly and perhaps disturbingly, very few such books have in fact been written. Maybe it is thought that such things are self-evident, but they are not. And I totally am behind you in that uh, remark. Um, of course, the counter uh, answer could be that uh, we are hardwired rule creators and rule followers, so, uh, so uh, probably it is a layman's exercise, it is a common sensual affair to do things like that. But I would just still have wished that there were more reflective lawyers in over uh, this management than only medical doctors, because not only medical, but, but there has been some tendency that medical doctors had, has had a oracle status, uh, not only uh, making the diagnosis about in which heading the society was going, uh, uh, direction the society was going in terms of the the virus, but also in terms of uh, how, what, which remedies of an administrative character were necessary. I don't think that a medical doctor uh, has a lot of, uh, is able, if he is not trained in this, to make that uh, balanced approach, analysis of competing principles and values. So, so uh, my uh, challenge to Shower is uh, if you can illuminate me if this has been uh, thought of or discussed anywhere else uh, and uh, are people just very happy about the Corona administration or is there skepticism at some level in, in other countries? Thank you. You have about 10 minutes to answer. Okay, I, I agree with most of that. I learned from much of it, I, uh, especially the end, uh, the idea that there are, might be um, experts and applying it to this is important. Let me make a few uh, elaborations on some of the things that you said, uh, just for the benefit of the audience. Uh, um, I did, uh, you mentioned uh, the speed limit example. Uh, so in the American state of Montana, which has a very large number of, uh, a very large land area and very few people, um, there are, as in most other places in the US, numerical speed limits, a lot higher than 80 kilometers per hour, but numerical speed limits. Um, about 15 years ago, Montana said, we have so many roads, uh, so many empty roads, um, 
uh, that uh, we don't really need numerical speed limits. We will instead eliminate numerical speed limits and just tell people that they must drive re reasonably and prudently. Um, that experiment ended um, <laughs> after a uh, little more than um, a year, partly because drivers had a very different conception among them of what was reasonable in, and prudent. Uh, so that goes to who's making the determination in terms of the subject, but so too police officers had a very different understanding of what was reasonable and prudent. Um, and if we are concerned about consistency and enforcement, um, then once again, uh, this was thought to be a problem. Montana eliminated their experiments with standards instead of rules uh, for speed limits. So that's just by way of a little bit more um, detail on the example you mentioned. So, but you also said, uh, and here I'm not less certain that I agree, um, you said that some preference for rules is in a way hardwired. Uh, oh, no, I was speculating uh, whether yeah. it might be. Yeah, right. So, yeah, it's, uh, yeah, yeah. so it's an interesting question mm -hmm. about whether people have a certain degree of preference for ruleness as opposed to standardness. Um, so uh, one of the things that rules do for the person who is subject to the rule is give the person subject to the rule very little choice. One of the things that standards do is they give the person subject to the standard, who might be the prime person engaged in primary conduct, but also might be the judge or police officer who's doing the enforcing, a great deal of choice. It turns out that there's actually a literature uh, not explicitly about rules and standards, but very close, uh, about the extent to which people want more or less choice. Um, so um, much of the literature um, has been um, produced by experimental work by social psychologists, some by the social psychologists just named Barry Schwartz, um, another by a social psychologist named Sheena Iyengar. Um, and one of the experiments that they have done involved supermarket choices. So with the benefit of a cooperative uh, supermarket, uh, they varied the number of choices that consumers had. Um, one of the experiments was done with olive oil one was done with mustard. Um, so the question is, when you go to the supermarket and you need mustard, how many choices do you want? So one of the things they determined, perhaps surprisingly to some, is that if people were given no choice or very little choice, if the shelf only had one kind of mustard or one kind of olive oil, people were reluctant to buy. They wanted choice. Um, they didn't like the idea that their choices were being um, too constrained. The surprising thing is that the same ha thing happened when there were too many choices. So if the supermarket shelf contained 80 different kinds of mustard or 60 different kinds of olive oil, people looked at all of these choices uh, and then um, they were, um, as it is put by Schwartz, they were paralyzed by the tyranny of choice and they didn't buy olive oil and they didn't buy mustard. Uh, so uh, both too little choice and too much choice uh, um, looked like it was problematic. So it may be that although this will vary um, with the context of the decision, people have some sense of the right amount of choice or the right amount of flexibility. So if we can apply this a little bit to rules and standards and law, we've seen a little bit of this in law, or at least I've seen a little bit of this in the law of, the, uh, of my own country. Um, so there are some laws that are um, extremely standard-like. They are extremely vague. Uh, some of them are 
in the Constitution. Um, the U.S. Constitution uh, prohibits unreasonable searches and seizures. Um, it uh, mandates the equal protection of the laws. Uh, vague standard-like directives. Um, and it turns out that and we also see this in ordinary statutory law. Uh, so um, American anti-competition law, antitrust law, is dominated by the Sherman Antitrust Act of 1890. The Sherman Antitrust Act of 1890 prohibits contracts, combinations, or conspiracies in restraint of trade. That's it. Also broad, vague, open-ended, standard-like. What we have seen in both of these areas is that when judges are given this amount of choice, they seek to, to limit their own choice. And when they are given that amount of choice, they create judge-made rules. Um, in antitrust trade law, they're called per se rules. Uh, in American constitutional law, we have frequent three and four part tests uh, that apply all of these very general rules. So that they take the enormous amount of choice that's given to them and they limit their own choices by adding sub rules to make the range of choice narrower. Conversely, it turns out that when judges are given very constraining rules, they will look very hard uh, to find exceptions or find qualifications or um, to metaphorically round off the sharp edges uh, of a rule. Um, and therefore, uh, the consequence of all of this is that uh, rules begin to look like standards once they are applied, and standards begin to look like rules once they are applied, um, and the difference in application uh, may be somewhat smaller uh, than if we just look um, at what is written down. Um, now, um, I mean, I was interested uh, in the example of 10 people, uh, the 10 person limitation um, at a funeral. Uh, this, um, I can imagine um, that uh, a somewhat more complex rule would begin to get very complex. Uh, um, does the number of people to be allowed at a funeral depend on, depend on how many people have been vaccinated or how many people have been tested? Does it depend on the religious tradition within the, which the funeral is taking place such that there is either a greater or a lesser degree of infringement on traditional um, religious practices? Uh, I can see the argument uh, for somewhat sim a simpler rule, even if it is under or um, over-inclusive. Now, you suggest at the end um, that these might be reasonable choices, but there ought to be something in a document that explains what the choices were, and in a democratic society, people ought to know what those choices were and why they were made. Uh, maybe. Uh, that is, uh, one of the things we've also seen um, is that when you give people the reasons behind the rule, they are more inclined to want to apply the reasons directly than to apply the rule uh, as it is written without reference to the reasons. So the um, great American realist legal theorist, Carl Llewellyn, who did most of his writing in the 1930s and 1940s, talked about the idea of a singing reason. That is, a rule that contains with the rule the reason for having that rule. 
and at least some more recent empirical work has suggested that when you give people the reason behind the rule, they're going to uh, try to determine for themselves whether the reason was or was not applicable to the particular situation. And if you think that the reason for having a rule is to not give people those choices, maybe it's important not to give them the reasons behind the rule. And with that, I will stop. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Do you hear me still? Yeah. yeah. But uh, yeah, uh, very good comments. And, and I'm sorry for uh, uh, protesting against uh, me saying that uh, rules for hardware. I, 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 I Recollect now, I actually did say that, <laughs> but uh, but uh, but I'm more interested in the, your other uh, points. Uh, uh, is a reason is a reason uh, behind the rule that is that it is not good to. I mean, if a directive is put forth and the, and and the, the reason for it is that this is a rule. And you are not going to question this is a rule because we are agreeing on tying our hands and not uh, playing the uncertain uh, game. And uh, I mean, then you are actually communicating to people that uh, we have a reason that is pro pretty contrary to what reasons used to be like behind rules. And this reason we will give you and now, now rest in peace and follow the rules. Isn't that a different matter than traditional purposes behind rules? I, I think it is different, yeah. um, but it is still telling people yeah. uh, we, are having a we are having a nice, crisp rule because we're not sure we trust you. Now, it may be true that we don't trust you, but uh, is it a good idea when we don't trust people to tell them that we don't trust people? Uh, there are experts on that in this room. We call them parents. Uh, uh, um, uh, I rarely use examples from families. I am a childless only child. So I know very little about families. Uh, but, uh, and it turns out that people with families deal with this all the time. They deal with precedence all the time. Uh, uh, so, um, uh, it's at least worthwhile thinking for those of you, uh, we've all been children, but for those of you who have children, uh, when you give the child uh, a rule uh, that is based on not trusting the child, uh, for example, never cross the street unless you are with an adult. Uh, which is, I gather, a plausible rule to give to a six or seven year old or something like that. Uh, do you want to tell the six or seven year old that's the rule because I don't trust you to make the decision yourself? I'll leave it for you to decide whether that's a good thing to do or not. <laughs> but is, uh, isn't this uh, presupposing or, uh, or creating a pretty paternalistic as opposed to democratic rule of law order? Yes, uh, yeah. but then the question is, uh, maybe any rule is of its nature paternalistic. Um, uh, lots, of, lots of laws are paternalistic. Uh, we don't let people um, make their own decisions about when they are old enough to drive uh, or, or what drugs they should use and a whole bunch of others. So yes, it's paternalistic. Uh, whether that makes it necessarily bad, uh, I'm not sure. I may be more sympathetic to paternalism uh, than others, maybe because I am less trustful uh, of people than others. Um, but uh, I do think there's an interesting question uh, that you raise and just now raise, even if we think at, at times it's good to be paternalistic, is it good to tell people we are being paternalistic? Uh, and that's a tricky question. Can I have one final yeah. comment? Uh, that uh, 10 uh, people rule in Denmark, as people rarely imagine departing from, they, uh, they had another rule that was uh, a criteria of distance such and such many people within a uh, square meter, such and such. So, yeah. But I, thank you. Yeah. But Which, this is very good I mean, response. Uh, once, once it's distance, 
then you're leaving more judgment to the people themselves. Most people, we like to think, can count to 10. Uh, we're less certain that people are good judges of distance, and we also think that people might engage in what the psychologists call motivated reasoning. That is, they evaluate the factual world based on their preferences for what they would like the factual world to be. Um, and I would guess that um, asking the typical seaman who comes off a ship uh, and is in a local bar after having spent a month at sea fishing, uh, do you, what distance do you think you are from the sailor next to you in the bar uh, is likely to get a, an answer uh, governed by that particular seaman's preferences at the moment. No, but uh, as far as the funerals go, yeah. I think the point would be that you could just uh, decide the capacity of the church based on its floor area. And then just produce a particular number. Yeah. Yeah, that, that's, that's more plausible, yes. Yeah. Right, right. As so, opposed to yeah, leaving it to the end. 10 people for uh, St. Paul's Cathedral yeah, at the right. uh, church out in the yeah. country. Yeah, tack för det. Uh, we now have our final uh, presentation, and that is Christian uh, Johansen. He's going to talk a bit about meaning and doctrine uh, in the context of legal transplants. Yeah. Now I found my presentation. Oh. Okay. Okay. Yeah. It is uh, my uh, honor to be here and uh, to speak uh, uh, in this uh, symposium. Now I have been teaching uh, ver uh, based on various articles by Professor Schauer for five years. Now he's here, so <laughs> it's a very unique opportunity. My presentation is, to a certain extent, based on the article I wrote uh, for Rutgers uh, Law Review, uh, but I have tried to um, address uh, some other uh, aspects as well uh, in, in this particular presentation. Um, it's called Meaning and Doctrine in the Context of Legal Transplants, and uh, my article was on, on lockstepping, and those are related uh, uh, concepts, as I will try to explain. Uh, first, a little bit of background for our foreign audience and our guest of honor. The Faroe Islands got home rule within the Kingdom of Denmark on April 1st, 1948. I won't go into the history behind that, just state that fact. And the concept was we had this Home Rule Act, and then we had uh, two lists of a bunch of policy areas, and then we could choose to assume uh, responsibility uh, over those uh, policy areas uh, at any time, basically. And the consequence of that is that the Faroese Parliament uh, gains legislative powers over the area, while the Faroese government gains executive powers. So this was a system of enumerated powers for the Faroe Islands, uh, and Denmark retained all other policy errors. But there is a consultation mechanism in the act. It's not a veto power, but it does 
in practice function almost as a veto power. And there are very, very few cases uh, of uh, Denmark extending any Danish legislation here with our cons without our consent. But in 2005, uh, the Home Rule Act was supplemented with two new acts, and now it's the reverse. Now there are very few uh, policy areas reserved for, for Denmark. Um, yes, there's been a discussion about whether the Home Rule, our Home Rule is revocable or not. Uh, but uh, I will not go into that. It's a complex uh, historical, uh, complex theoretical discussion that has been going on for decades. Um, then there's the concept of legal transplants, and uh, legal transplants have been talked about a lot within comparative law, and uh, it's this idea where you, uh, Professor Scherer, you mentioned it earlier yourself about Estonia. You are borrowing law from elsewhere, and it's very prevalent here in the Faroe Islands. Pierre Legrand, he is uh, uh, very famous to, to, uh, about this area, and he said uh, he, he used simply the dictionary definition of a transplant, and then what he's saying that for the lawyer's purpose, the transfer is one that occurs across jurisdiction. There is something of a given jurisdiction that's not native to it, and that has been brought there from another. Um, and in this case, he mentions this is our statutes, and that's what we do a lot in the Faroe Islands. We, uh, even though uh, these are policy areas under our own jurisdiction, by our, by our own voluntary choice, we tend to uh, borrow statutes from Denmark and then translate them into Faroese. Uh, and we might make some minimal adjustments for the Faroese context, but mostly they are one-to-one -one the same as the equivalent Danish statutes. So Faroese legal drafting consists to a large extent in translation work. So that raises the question of the desirability of legal transplant. And much has been written about that in the literature. Uh, I will not recapitulate that debate, but I will only note that um, in the Faroe Islands, there's the special factor of our small size. So given our small size, we don't have a lot of resources for legal drafting and all of these things. So you could easily argue that to a certain extent, legal transplants are simply a necessity here in the Faroe Islands. We must have them. Uh, but the minimum thing you could require here would be to say that you need to make a reflective choice in any gift given case. Is this an area of the law uh, where the similarities between the Faroe Islands and Denmark is high? That might uh, count in favor of just going with a transplant if it is an area where uh, things are very different here, or for example where our size matters are a lot, or our culture matters a lot, then maybe we should not uh, do uh, any copying. Although this is not necessarily an either-or thing, it depends on how many ad uh, ad adaptions you make to the statute, how well you uh, fit it to a new context. So th th this, is, like many things, is a spectrum, a continuum of uh, you can copy everything one-to-one -one, or you can create something uh, yourself from the ground up. Those are the extremes, uh, and then there's a lot of middle ground there. We tend to be more towards the extreme of copying, but even in the Faroe Islands, it will not be completely one-to-one. -one. There are almost always at least some small adjustments, uh, even just mentioning public institutions that we have in the Faroe Islands instead of the equivalents in Denmark. Uh, but this is, you could say, is stage one. Okay, you have decided we are going to uh, adopt some legal text that is uh, foreign in origin. That's typically from Denmark. Uh, but then there comes a follow-on question. Once you have made the choice to go with a legal transplant, then there's the choice. That's the choice about the text of the statute itself. But what about everything else? Law is much more than just the legal texts of statutes. There's also the, the doctrines that go with it. And that brings us from the question of legal transplants to the question you uh, have discussed a lot in the United States with lockstepping. Uh, how do you uh, interpret, and who, as it turns out, 
uh, the word interpret can be important, uh, these statutes in the new context. Um, so transplanting a statute, that's the law uh, on the books. Then the question is, how will the law function in, uh, in action? So even though you um, uh, borrow or copy some statute, it could be that the Faroese interpretation would be uh, different uh, in uh, some way or to some extent than the equivalent Danish doctrine. But when you talk about borrowing doctrine as opposed to just the texts of a provision, you often this has often been called lockstepping in the American literature. Um, the article I wrote for Rutgers Law Review was for the, an issue of Rutgers Law Review that was in honor of Robert Williams uh, as he was retiring. Uh, and he has, uh, uh, in this article I reference here, he has um, uh, put forth these different models of lockstepping. So I will quickly go through them. Unreflective adoptionism, that is when you uh, unreflectively just say, okay, whatever. In his case, he's writing about the state constitutions in the US, and he's, uh, he has some examples of this where he says that uh, state supreme courts in the United States uh, have interpreted their, the provisions of their state constitutions that are uh, the parallel of various provisions of the U.S. Constitution in exactly the same way as the U.S. Supreme Court. Uh, and when this happens uh, unreflectively without uh, giving it a thought and without considering alternatives, that's what he calls uh, unreflective adoptionism. Reflective adoption within the context of lockstepping is basically the opposite, where you say, uh, okay, uh, the doctrine put forth by the U.S. Supreme Court, it makes sense. They have argued well in their judicial opinions for why they have adopted this doctrine. We see no reason for why it should be different in our state, so we will go with the same uh, doctrine that they have gone with. Prospective lockstepping is basically uh, unreflective uh, adoptionism on steroids. That is where uh, you go with the doctrine of the U.S. Supreme Court, and then the U.S. Supreme Court changes its doctrine, and the state Supreme Court follows along uh, in the changed direction, whether they like that direction or not. Uh, and this last one is uh, fairly specific to uh, U.S. legal t terminology. That's when you adopt a test from the U U.S. Supreme Court, but you might apply it differently. This is also some, uh, a slight variant of prospective lockstepping. So these are the models uh, put forth by uh, Robert Williams in, in this article that we also have used a lot for our teaching. Yeah. Okay, so that's what lockstepping is. You have a legal transplant of some sort, um, but uh, you have also adopted the legal doctrine put forth by the courts in the, the jurisdiction or country where you have your legislation from. Uh, however, this is talking about what happens in courts. And the Faroe Islands currently does not have its own court systems. Uh, we have the potential to set up our own court system aside from the Danish Supreme Court if we want to, but we haven't done, done it so far. So there are not two parallel tracks of courts that can do this. Um, but for two reasons, you can still talk about, I think, lockstepping in the Faroe Islands. Uh, for one, you could imagine these common Danish Faroese courts uh, taking the Faroese con context into consideration and differentiating their interpretation uh, of uh, the Faroese statutes and the Danish statutes, even though they are borrowed. That's a, at least a possibility. It might not be likely, but you could imagine that. So it makes sense to talk about that. But uh, as the Faroese audience members know, we also have some... Uh, 
uh, institutions formally within the executive uh, as we, that have some kind of adjudicatory or semi-adjudicatory functions, like we have a system of appeals boards, for example. So they could definitely uh, have differences in their doctrine compared to their Danish count counterparts. Then the question is, do they? Do does lockstepping ha happen in the Faroe Islands? Uh, yes, I would say. Uh, I, I have not put any examples in my slides here, but uh, I have some in my article for Rutgers. Uh, and uh, uh, there was um, actually a recent Danish Supreme Court case where they were confronted by the two, two provisions dealing with uh, a legal basis for taxation, where both the Faroese frame of government and the Danish constitution require taxes to be set by law. And the question was if a certain fee was a tax that had to be set by law or not. Uh, and they discussed the, Danish, the provision of the Danish constitution. Uh, and even though they were urged to by one of the lawyers, for one of the parties, they did not even discuss the Faroese provision. They mentioned it, but they just said that uh, they didn't say anything about whether it should be interpreted uh, differently or not. Just to take one example, there could be many other examples from the administrative appeals boards, from uh, our Umbusmauer, as we call them, the Faroese equivalent of the Danish Ombudsman, which has been uh, exported institution, they say, but you can discuss whether or not it's the same institution really around the world. Um, so I would say what we have here is pretty much unreflective adoptionism. I don't know of any case where uh, the question of whether or not to adopt Danish doctrine really has been uh, discussed. Uh, you could imagine that an appeals board, for example, uh, discusses the question, well, we should uh, do the same as in Denmark because of reasons X, Y, and Z, uh, but uh, I, I don't know of any example of that. That would be reflective uh, adoptionism then. Um, and uh, it seems like a persuasive, uh, pervasive default position that what they do in Denmark, we have to do here. Uh, and you could wonder about the reasons for that. Uh, I was talking about the lack of resources. That could genuinely be uh, 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 one reason. And another reason could be the uh, uh, training of the lawyers. They often tend to be uh, Danish educated lawyers. So they are familiar with the Danish system. And well, maybe our law programs here could change that to an extent. That could be an ambition in any case. Uh, these quotes are not as clear as I had hoped, as they were on my computer, but we will see if we can manage anyway. Uh, this is about the consequences and implications of the lockstepping we are seeing here. Um, and Professor Schauer uh, wrote an article in 1988 called Formalism. And formalism is a lot of, um, uh, it is maybe one of the, um, one example of legal terminology that sometimes can be uh, seen or heard by, by lay people. Uh, uh, they don't really know what it is, but somehow, uh, there is a bad reputation for formalism. Uh, and Professor Schauer, he describes uh, formalism uh, in different senses in this article, and in the more pejorative sense, you could say, is this case, the famous Lochner case. Some of our law students might be a bit familiar with it, uh, but it's perhaps one of the most derided cases by the US Supreme Court, uh, where they said that a law dealing with uh, the working hours of uh, bakers in New York was unconstitutional because 
it was a violation of the 14th Amendment. Uh, and especially this one word was in the focus, the word liberty. So they were reading a lot into the word liberty. And what the Professor Schauer says is that although Lochner is criticized for the length of its reach, a closer look reveals that it's not the result that's condemned as formalistic, but rather the justification for that result. The formalism in Lochner inheres in its denial of the political, moral, social, and economic choices involved in the decision, and indeed in its denial that there was any choice at all. So this is sort of what can sometimes be seen as a layman's uh, view of the law, where uh, the law is simply reading statutes and reading constitutional provisions or contractual provisions and, okay, this is what it says, so this must be the result in this case. Uh, and very often uh, that can be uh, far from the truth because uh, as uh, Barr was talking about legal standards, for example, often uh, the text only tells us so much and it needs to be applied in practice for it to have any real meaning, to be operationalized somehow. Uh, and that can often be done in different ways. Uh, when you talk about lockstepping, you could follow the path, for example, of Danish courts, or you can choose not to. That's a choice. Uh, and if you deny that you have a choice, then this is the sense of formalism that uh, Professor Schauer is talking about here. And an unfortunate consequence that can be of so slavishly following the Danish uh, doctrine can be that, uh, can be uh, unfortunate for us since the Faroe Islands are so much smaller than Denmark. Denmark is population-wise approximately 110 times bigger. Uh, so what works for Denmark does not necessarily always work for us. Um, however, there can be, uh, it can differ from one context to another to what extent it makes sense to follow Denmark. It could be a very sensible, rational choice to reflectively say uh, Denmark has a very well-developed uh, doctrine, we don't, and again, our size can be a factor. Because we are so small, uh, we have few cases and therefore few opportunities to develop doctrine. But this argument is not an argument for uh, uncritically borrowing what they do in Denmark, but rather that maybe we should borrow as a reflective choice. And I think that makes all the difference in the world whether you have reflected over something or not. Uh, the same decision can be very sensible if you have reflected over it, but maybe not so much if it's unreflective and you just uh, do what you're used to. Uh, another author who has touched upon this is James Gartner, and from a uh, very famous article from 1992, he said, second, lockstep analysis is conducive to the perception that the state constitution is some sort of redundancy. Uh, that is, it's a source of law that has no particular value or purpose and therefore need not be taken seriously. Why do we have these separate Faroese statutes if A, the statutes themselves are just borrowed without much thought from Denmark, and then B, uh, the doctrine from Denmark is borrowed too? Why couldn't we then just use uh, the Danish statutes on these issues? Why have we uh, got these, why are these policy areas even under Faroe's jurisdiction uh, if we are going to always do what they do in Denmark anyway? Uh, and actually sometimes you see this criticism that, oh, this and that statute is not up to date. Why, what does that mean that something is not up to date? Up to date compared to what? And the answer will almost inevitably be that they have produced some amendments in Denmark and we haven't had the time to copy them yet. And then after some years, 
we see this is, this is too bad. This is, we really need to do something here. So we uh, gather some resources and make sure to copy the amendments they've made in Denmark. And then maybe Denmark has already moved on when we do that. So there is this lag effect as well where uh, we do this copying, yes, and the copying is very much one-to-one, -one, both of the actual statutory text, but also of uh, the doctrine that goes with it. Uh, but due to Denmark moving much faster than we do, actually there can be some differences in the law uh, that develop over time anyway, uh, such that uh, they, are not, they are not intended by our politicians that things should be different in uh, the Faroe Islands and Denmark, uh, uh, but we don't even have the resources to copy fast enough uh, for uh, the legal situation to be the same in both places. But I had a key word a moment ago. That is interpretation. So now I want to take a little bit of time towards the end to talk about the importance of that word. Because this is a word that's very well known by lay people, but in, at least in the US literature, there is this uh, discussion about the difference between interpretation and construction. Uh, what's that, you might ask? Well, one uh, proponent of that distinction is Lawrence Solom, one of Professor Shower's colleagues, actually, right now. Uh, and he has a definition uh, in an article from 2010. The basic idea can be explained by distinguishing two different moments or stages that occur when an authority, authoritative legal text, a constitution, statute, regulation, rule, is applied or explicated. The first of these moments is interpretation, which I shall stipulate is the process or activity that recognizes or discovers the linguistic meaning or the semantic content of the legal text. This is important, the linguistic meaning or semantic context of the legal text. So this has to do with the language of the law. So interpretation, according to Lawrence Solom, that has to do with figuring out the meaning of the law as a matter of language. Then he says, the second moment is construction, which I shall stipulate is the process that gives a, legal, a text legal effect, either by translating the linguistic meaning into legal doctrine or by applying or implementing the text. This difference between meaning on the one hand and doctrine on the other hand uh, can be helpful when we try to grasp this concept of lockstepping. Because a lay person uh, might ask us, what are you talking about? You're talking about a different interpretation of the same text, in, in this case in the Faroe Islands and Denmark. Of course, the same words must mean the same thing no matter if you are in the Faroe Islands or Denmark. That could be a, a lay person's uh, justification for lockstepping. But if you have this uh, distinction in mind, you can explain to the lay person that often there might be something more to it than just a simple reading of a text. Uh, because often there can be very little we can read out of a text and more that we have to read into the text when we are creating our doctrine. So is this distinction uh, crucial for... Uh, someone that wants to uh, discuss uh, this issue of lockstepping, or can you talk about lockstepping even without this distinction? And that's where we get back to our honored guest, because Professor Schauer has recently written an article on this distinction, where he takes a more critical approach. And his main point has to do with the pervasiveness of a specialized legal language, because this distinction, as uh, defined here by Lawrence Solom, uh, has everything to do with this distinction between the linguistic and the legal. But if everything is legal, then that's basically Professor Schauer's point, this uh, distinction collapses. Uh, he says, uh, one thing he says in this article is, when the words or phrases to be interpreted are technical and not ordinary language, and thus simply cannot be interpreted as ordinary language, 
the basic point of the distinction between interpretation and the uh, construction, the idea that legal goals and principles enter into the process at the construction stage disappears. Moreover, if the rules, principles, and institutions of law constitute much of legal language in the same ways that the rule of baseball constitute home run, then once again the realm of the legal becomes a necessary component of the process of interpretation. So it's a collapse of these two stages uh, that Professor Schauer has in mind. Um, however, I, when I was reading this very interesting article, uh, I was thinking that actually what he's saying could just as well be that everything is construction, often. Uh, because here the legal enters into the picture right away. And that's exactly what uh, Lawrence Solomon would call construction. So. Uh, in this collapsed concept, uh, you could just as well call it maybe construction. But more importantly, I think, is that this kind of critique of the distinction between uh, uh, interpretation and construction still leaves a lot of room for uh, this discussion of lockstepping. Because when everything is legal, there's a lot of room for going in a different way, for example, here in the Faroe Islands than in Denmark or in a US state compared to the federal level. Because it's exactly in what Lawrence Solomon calls the construction zone that there is a greater, uh, greatest room for uh, different approaches to the same legal uh, text. Um, so uh, a, uh, an approach that does away with the distinction from this perspective that Professor Schauer is doing, uh, I think still leaves a lot of uh, room with an argument for a more reflective approach to the question of lockstepping. If on the other hand, instead you were to say everything is a matter of language, then perhaps there would be uh, a smaller room or zone for having a discussion about to what extent we should borrow doctrine. But then again, maybe there wouldn't really be much doctrine to borrow because everything would just be the text. So, yeah, that's it. So, uh, as you mentioned, there is a debate out there about transplanting. Um, mm -hmm. And just for those of you unfamiliar with the debate, um, uh, there are, well, there are a bunch of debates, but at least one of the debates um, is about whether transplanting the law from another system is or is not efficient. Uh, so on one side of the debate, um, we have a uh, group of economists, uh, Laporta, Lopez de Solanas, Schleifer, and Vishni, uh, LLSV in the literature because they have written so much uh, in this regard. Um, so they have done, um, a few years ago, um, they did an elaborate uh, econometric analysis um, of um, the relationship between legal families, the cluster of laws that some country might adopt, uh, uh, and uh, economic growth. So they divided the world um, into five, um, four legal families. Um, one was the common law, um, the second was the French version of civil law, the third was the Scandinavian version of civil law, and the fourth was the German version of civil law. Uh, and then they looked at all of the countries, mostly former colonies, um, that had adopted uh, or taken on one or another um, variety of law or legal systems from uh, these various different families. And they came to the conclusion um, that what 
uh, newly independent countries ought to do uh, is adopt common law models. Um, and said that their conclusion was that the common, a common law legal system was most conducive to economic growth. Uh, now, that might, um, uh, that might be, I mean, the, the econometrics of their analyses have been debated, uh, as well as the question um, whether uh, in evaluating the data they were influenced by their own ideological priors. Uh, one of the good things from their point of view about the common law is that it's inefficient. It's inefficient and it's non-pervasive. Uh, that unlike the most uh, pervasive versions of the civil law, such as the uh, Napoleonic Code, uh, the uh, goal is to regulate everything in advance. And therefore, there's nothing in theory that's unregulated. The common law, by contrast, regulates only when there's a particular reason to regulate. Therefore, they say, uh, this produces uh, in systems that follow the French model a great deal of regulation and, in, and systems that follow um, the common law model, much less regulation, uh, and that's good for economic growth. So that's one side of the debate. The other side of the debate, um, the most prominent figure um, is a, uh, some years ago, colleague of mine now at the Columbia Law School, Katharina Pistor. Uh, so uh, Pistor has identified uh, what she calls the transplant effect uh, and her view, uh, independent of which model it is, that if you try to take um, the law from one system and put it into another system with different institutions, you will lose a fair amount by trying to put the substantive law from one institution, from one system into um, another system with quite different institutions. Uh, she's done emp some empirical work in support of this, um, even better empirical work in support of the same conclusion um, was done uh, by another former colleague of mine, uh, Joseph Kalt, uh, who did an elaborate empirical study about the American, uh, uh, Native American or in American Indian nations in terms of making their own constitutions. Uh, so it turns out that there are uh, about 400 quasi-autonomous American Indian nations. Uh, some of them that turn out to have casinos are very wealthy, some that don't have casinos not so wealthy, but there are about 400 of these. One of the interesting things is that up until about 30 years ago, all of these quasi-autonomous uh, nations had constitutions that were imposed upon them from a United States federal agency called the Bureau of Indian Affairs. One of the nice things about that, nice or not nice uh, as a matter of morality and politics, it was nice for academics because it created a wonderful natural experiment. That is, there was a very large data set of Indian nations, some of which had it created their own constitutions and some of which had constitutions imposed upon them by the Bureau of Indian Affairs and Kalt and his colleagues came to the conclusion uh, that controlling for a very large number of variables, um, having uh, an indigenously made constitution is more conducive to economic growth than having an imposed constitution and their explanation for that is that if you have to make your own constitution, you have to create the institutions of constitution making, which include some institutions of cooperation and coordination, and if you have to create those institutions, those institutions are themselves available for economic growth as well. Uh, so economic growth is a side benefit of having to create the institutions um, of constitution making. So there is that debate. Um, uh, out there. So two other things I want to talk briefly about. One, um, virtually all of what Christian talked about was about borrowing. 
uh, not very much about imposing. Uh, and it may be that with, uh, uh, with nice countries like Denmark and the Faroe Islands, uh, imposing is not that much of an issue. But it turns out that in other contexts, imposing um, is a bigger issue, sometimes for good and sometimes not for good. So to give at least one example of one that I've uh, found myself involved in a little bit some years ago, um, there is an international, um, well, there is a bilateral trade agreement between the United States and Vietnam um, called the United States-Vietnam Bilateral Trade Agreement. The United States-Vietnam Bilateral Trade Agreement requires Vietnam to have certain procedures for civil litigation designed to make sure that aggrieved business partners uh, can have some recourse. So it turns out um, that Vietnam, which had developed some number of its civil litigation procedures, um, had a system in which it was uh, considered perfectly appropriate for the judge in civil litigation to call up a high official of the Communist Party to get that official's uh, judgment about how the case ought to come out before issuing a ruling. Uh, this, as you might suspect, um, is rather at odds with, broadly speaking, Western conceptions uh, of civil litigation. And basically what the United States did is used its economic power to say to Vietnam, uh, if you want the benefits of this trade agreement, then you've got to change certain aspects of your civil litigation system, whether you like it or not. Uh, that's somewhat similar to what I said earlier about Estonia uh, and Germany, uh, that at least in some of my thinking and in some of my writing, one of the big issues about transplants is politics and incentives and not just the choices that are made by the transplanting company, but rather the politics, the incentives, and the economics uh, of what is sometimes imposition um, rather than just borrowing. Now, let me just finish uh, with an eye on the clock uh, to say a little bit about unreflective adoptionism, uh, which you don't like. Uh, but there is an interesting analogy um, to um, unreflective adoptionism. Um, and at least in common law systems, the uh, analogy is to a strong system of precedent. Um, uh, it's one of the things that's being actively debated uh, right now in the US uh, because for um, now close to uh, 50 years, there's been an active debate about whether, uh, about abortion, about, about the extent to which the Constitution protects um, the right of a woman to obtain an abortion as a matter of constitutional law, not as a matter of state statutory law um, or anything else. Uh, so now that um, the U.S. Supreme Court has a majority of justices who think that Roe versus Wade in 1973 was wrongly decided. The question is, uh, and the, uh, should those justices um, be, be persuaded to engage in a practice of unreflective adoptionism, which we might call precedent, or we might call uh, stare decisis in common law uh, language. That is, follow an earlier decision just because it is earlier. Um, so uh, the relatively recently deceased Justice Scalia, uh, who had strong views about a lot of things, um, not only had strong views about abortion, uh, and not only strong views about Roe versus Wade, but strong views about precedent. Uh, his view um, was, I'll use my language and not his, but he would have said something pretty similar to this, why should I be forced to follow the decision of some clown 50 years ago uh, just because it was 50 years old? Uh, um, I, uh, I have an obligation and I have taken an oath to, to obey the Constitution. I have not taken an 
an oath to obey the judgments of this clown from 50 years ago, uh, or even five clowns from 50 years ago, so I'm going to make my own determinations. Uh, all of this is, he is saying, or was saying, and others now say it, is in effect reflective adoptionism. That is, what he and others have said is, we're only going to follow the decisions of the past if we've decided that we ought to follow the decisions of the past and that that's most likely to be based on whether we agree or disagree. Um, uh, as Oliver Wendell Holmes put it, uh, nothing is more infuriating than to have to follow a decision only because it was so laid down at the time of Henry IV. Uh, uh, unreflective adoptionism. But precedent and stare decisis is about unreflective adoptionism. Uh, it is about stability for stability's sake. It is about consistency for consistency's sake. Uh, and much of law, as opposed to politics and many other things, might be about consistency for consistency's sake. So I'll leave you to think about it. I'll leave you to decide about it. Um, but at least the similarities struck me as uh, suggesting that there might be more to be said, at least in law, for unreflective adoptionism uh, than we might think. And I'll stop at that. And while I have the floor, just thank all of you for your attention, all of you for organizing uh, this event, uh, flattering and enlightening. <laughs> I actually have a question. <laughs> uh, as a part of, um, well, we read a bit about uh, your different texts. And I, I, I don't really remember exactly which text it was, but it wa in one of them, you speak very much of predictability, uh, stability, yeah. uh, as very good traits. Uh, when, when you talk about presidents. Yeah. In st uh, uh, I think you said, instead of taking uh, the, uh, making a decision that feels good right now, uh, in the short term, we also have to think about the long term and other values such as predictability right. and stability. Uh, and those are also relevant here. Yeah. When you think about that. So, yeah, I didn't. Yes, yes. Uh, I mean, that's clearly right. Um, uh, I mean, there is an interesting question here. Um, uh, I do think that predictability and stability, I'm not sure I would say that they are good. They may be the particular virtues of the legal system. That is, we might want to think of the legal system as the brakes on a car and other parts of a political system is the accelerator. It may be that the comparative advantage of law is predictability and stability, and maybe the compar comparative advantage of a legislature or an executive is a degree of less constrained, more democratic creativity, innovation, and everything else, and we might have both in the same system. But, so, yes, uh, the argument for um, unreflective adoptionism might be, uh, again, similar kind of stability. It's not for me to say whether what the Faroe Islands should or should not do um, about Denmark, but I can imagine someone saying, uh, Denmark is not a crazy country. Uh, I'll leave you to decide whether uh, that's true. Denmark is not a crazy country. Uh, it's been around for a long time. It's been pretty successful. We're not talking about Zimbabwe um, or North Korea. We're not even talking about the United States. Uh, this is a very stable, well-functioning country uh, and has been for a long time. So I can pe see people saying, Danes perhaps especially, but I can see people saying, this is not the worst model in the world to follow, um, and if we try to decide each time whether we ought to follow or not, 
Maybe we'll get it right sometimes, maybe we'll get it wrong sometimes, but there might be an argument for not being reflective when we're being non-reflective about uh, borrowing from a system that's operated pretty well for almost a thousand years. Uh, I can see arguments against that. Uh, I have no uh, dog in this fight, as it is put in uh, English vernacular, uh, but I can at least see um, something of that variety as an argument. Thank you. Uh, do you. Does anyone have any final questions for Mr. Schauer? Right? Uh, I would like to give you uh, <laughs> the microphone for a few final words. Thank you. <clears throat> well, uh, this is an event of our um, Institute for Legal Research. I'm the director uh, at the moment. And so uh, I would like to thank uh, Professor Schauer for coming here and uh, taking part in our classes and uh, uh, giving us the opportunity to discuss with him in this symposium. Uh, even though I'm the director of this institute, I am not actually the person who uh, organized the symposium. Uh, so I would like to thank all the people who organized the symposium for the work they did. And I would like to thank very much the uh, uh, administration of this fine institution um, for his support or for the support of uh, the <coughs> institution for our uh, uh, research institute and for this event. And finally, I would like to thank all of you for coming and uh, your stamina is impressive, <laughs> and, uh, and uh, I hope we can have uh, some more events of this kind uh, fairly soon. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you.